program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the City of Eau Claire. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. Welcome everyone, please, uh, please find your seats. We're going to um, start off our meeting this evening with our Pledge of Allegiance. Um, if folks would like to rise, and we're going to pledge allegiance now. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Welcome everyone this evening to City Council Chambers. I want to thank the scouts that are joining us as well this evening. Welcome. Just going to first uh, thank our city clerk for calling the roll and for all of her help through each of these meetings. I want to welcome everyone again to Council Chambers and thank Valley Media Works this evening for their help in live streaming the proceedings for people who are not able to make it. Um, to see those, to see that proceeding, please visit valleymediaworks.org or visit Government Channel 99.4 on Charter Cable. Please know this is also simulcast on WRFP LP 101.9 FM. And past proceedings of the Eau Claire City Council can be found on Valley Media Works YouTube channel. We're going to move to our first order of business this evening and, and uh, take up um, our public hearings. Um, first up is our zoning. Uh, this item number one is a public hearing on ordinance rezoning property located on the west side of First Avenue between Chippewa Street and Niagara Street from RM to P. This evening, Mr. Pat Ivory is going to present. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, tonight, is, tonight is the public hearing on the rezoning of 111 Niagara Street from uh, RM Mixed Residential to P Public. Uh, the property is owned by the city. Uh, it's located at the southwest corner of First Avenue and, and Niagara Street. This is the property located uh, right here. It's a little over one acre in size on uh, Niagara, First Avenue, Chippewa, and then Owen Park located across the street. There's an aerial of the area also with uh, Niagara, Chippewa, First Avenue, uh, Owen Park located right here. Uh, yeah. I should be on. Okay. The uh, city purchased the property back in 1997 uh, using FEMA funds. Uh, in order to buy the individual properties. Uh, back at that time, there were about five or six properties that were acquired uh, that were within the floodplain. Upon acquisition of the properties, the, the, the structures were removed, and essentially the property has been left as a vacant lot since that time. Uh, use of the FEMA funds restricts uh, future structures from being constructed on the property, and since that time, the city has provided very limited maintenance on that, only uh, some periodic mowing of the grass, essentially. A group from the historic uh, Randall Park neighborhood has approached the city uh, with the plan to enhance the appearance of the parcel with some plantings uh, and also encouraging public use of that with possibly some yard games such as bocce ball or coob uh, and trying to make the space more welcoming to the public. Uh, the Randall Park neighborhood plan in, uh, includes a recommendation encouraging the city and the neighborhood to develop a plan to improve the property uh, to make it more of an asset to the neighborhood. Uh, the plan commission discussed uh, the property back at, on March f uh, 4th uh, with their meeting and authorized staff to initiate the process uh, to rezone this to public. As part of the discussion, uh, we learned that uh, there has been some parking going on over on the west side of the property, over in this area right here. 
uh, and we did some uh, checking regarding that. There is no formal agreement uh, with the city uh, for anyone to actually formally use that. Uh, staff from the Community Services Department reached out to uh, landlords in the area to see if uh, they were aware of that, and they indicated that there was not any agreement between landlords and any students for using that. So uh, the parking has basically been kind of going on uh, without any kind of a, any kind of agreement or anything uh, based on the information that we have found. So what we would plan to do uh, with the park being, re this area being rezoned to uh, public and used as a public space is sign that parking basically for the public to use it for, uh, for the park uh, in terms of what they can enjoy it for the public use. The Waterways and Parks Commission reviewed the application and recommends approval. The uh, commission suggested uh, the possibility of adding uh, some benches in, in addition to the landscaping that the neighborhood would do, possibly adding a couple small identification signs to better identify the property as an open space and, and also encourage more utilization of that uh, space for the public. Uh, Plan Commission reviewed this last Monday and they recommended approval. And then there is another item a little bit later on your agenda that would uh, discuss actually adding this to our parks inventory and our five-year parks plan. Uh, with that, if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Ivory. Are there questions from council at this time regarding the presentation? Any questions? I see none. Um, so we're going to open up this item to public input. Um, and just so folks are aware, um, each speaking turn is five minutes. So if you approach the podium, please state your name and your address. You'll see the light here will change from green to red. Um, when it's red, that means your five minutes is up. Um, if you do not wish to speak this evening during our public comment period after each item, you can also fill out a form in the back of the room. We have a blue form. Uh, you can fill that out. We get that information at our desk too. So there's that option. If you're not here to speak on any of the three agenda items, um, my apologies, um, four agenda items um, listed here, but you're here to speak during the public uh, comment period, please make sure you sign up at the back of the room. Um, and those are three minute speaking turns. So are there folks here this evening who came to talk about specifically this rezoning on Niagara Street? Is there anyone here this evening that would like to speak on the rezoning on Niagara and Chippewa? Seeing no one here to speak on that item, we will move then to item number two on our agenda. This is a public hearing on an ordinance rezoning property located at 103, 117, 123 Roosevelt Ave. From R1 to P Public and to approve a site plan for a visitor center and admissions building with site improvements. This is in file Z164219. Mr. Pat Ivory has this presentation as well. Thank you again, Robert. Uh, the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire and Ayers Associates are requesting to rezone property from R1 to P Public and then approval of a site plan to construct a new visitor center at the southwest corner of Roosevelt and Park Avenue. This is the subject property that we're talking about here, uh, Park Avenue, Roosevelt. Uh, there's residential to the east. Uh, to the northeast, and then the university campus to the west, and then to the north. Uh, Little Niagara Creek kind of runs through the property located right here, and then Putnam Park is located down in this area here. The west portion of the subject property is zoned R1, and that would be rezoned to TP Public, and then the east portion is already zoned, uh, already zoned public. This is the uh, portion of the property, these three lots that are currently zoned R1. There used to be uh, three homes that were located on it that have been removed a number of years ago. And in this area already is zoned, uh, zoned P. One thing I did want to point out uh, back on the aerial is that uh, the visitor center that we're talking about essentially is located 
on the northern portion of the area that we're talking about with Little Niagara going through here. Uh, the visitor center is in, in this area right here, kind of the northern part of that. In terms of the site plan, the site plan shows a, two, a new two-story visitor center uh, that would have a first floor footprint of about 8,000 square feet uh, located right in this area here. This is uh, Park Avenue, Roosevelt. Uh, Little Niagara will be located at the bottom of the sketch here. Uh, the university to the west and to the north over in that area there. Uh, the building uh, and parking lot would be set back 50 feet from the ordinary high water mark uh, of Little Niagara, which is in compliance with the city's waterway and greenway guidelines. This uh, dashed line right here is the 50 foot uh, setback uh, from the ordinary high water mark. Uh, the building uh, there is also a 50-foot setback required for wetland areas that's administered by the Wisconsin DNR. A small portion of the parking lot would be within that setback and will require uh, approval, approval from the DNR. That line is this highlighted yellow line right here. And you can see a small portion of the parking lot is uh, within that 50-foot setback there. As part of the application, the university notes that the new parking lot uh, will have actually a reduced encroachment in this wetland area in, in comparison to the existing parking lot. Uh, regarding parking, the site plan shows 22 parking stalls uh, located over to the east of the building here. And that will be a redesign of the existing parking lot that has 18 stalls, so there'll be a net gain of four, four parking spaces. The small visitors uh, building that's there will be removed, uh, and the plan calls for using the existing 24-foot uh, curb cut that's right here at the end of, of Park Avenue. Uh, regarding parking, the zoning ordinance as it relates to parking requirements for university facilities states that uh, due to the unique parking needs of colleges and universities that the university uh, shall provide information relating to how the new building impacts the parking demand. In this case, uh, the information that's been submitted that's included in your packet, the university notes that staff from the admissions department and alumni foundation will be relocated from Schofield Hall over to this new building and that the primary admission functions that presently occur at Schofield Hall and Davies Center will be relocated to this new building. So as part of that, uh, the vacated spaces of these buildings from that staff uh, will be utilized by existing departments with uh, no new staff planned. Uh, the university notes that the existing staff replace uh, relocating to the building that happened to drive uh, will, uh, to work will continue to use parking facilities that they have so in the past. So there is no uh, increase in, in staff and essentially the facilities that are being uh, currently provided within the university would be re relocated uh, to this new building with no ch actual change that way. Uh, bicycle parking would be located to the uh, front of the building right at this location right here. Uh, the site plan shows multiple uh, pedestrian connections to the university facilities uh, to the west and the north. Uh, this includes a combination of sidewalks, pathways, and three crosswalks crossing uh, the former Roosevelt Avenue, which was vacated back in 2018. And this provides access to Snyder Hall to the north and the other university facilities to the west. So this is one of the crosswalk areas here, one here, and one here. Uh, we were contacted by the uh, university and heirs uh, late on Friday and then had some discussions uh, this afternoon. Uh, they're looking at a proposed change to the crosswalk location right here. Uh, and this is similar, uh, somewhat similar to a discussion that we had with Plan Commission. Uh, what's being proposed with the change with this crosswalk here is that rather than have the crosswalk uh, go across Roosevelt at this angle here, which was a little bit of a concern at Plan Commission, is that they're going to relocate, they're proposing to relocate that in this location here. So crossing Roosevelt uh, at, a, at basically where Roosevelt is a, a narrower than it would be at this location here, and then line up with this sidewalk right here. So this crosswalk would be uh, 12 feet in wide, it would be a painted crosswalk. Uh, 
at this location here and then other changes they would be removing a, a tree at this location there's proposals these two uh, red uh, points here are what's called rapid rectangular uh, flashing beacons and what they're proposing is to install uh, one double-faced uh, beacon signal here and one uh, right here that would point this way and this way and that those are act, uh, button activated devices for the pedestrians basically to alert the motorists uh, when people are using this uh, this crossing so that would be proposed as part of that in addition the plaza area right here they've indicated uh, that they would modify the trees uh, softscape and hardscape in order to route the traffic from the door of the building uh, over towards this uh, crosswalk so that's something that we would want to see as a revised uh, one of the conditions we want to see a revised uh, site plan at a later date uh, that staff would approve that would show that reconfiguration of that sidewalk to that location here this is a uh, example of what one of the uh, the the beacons look like uh, you might be familiar the city uh, recently installed uh, one one of these similar to this on Farwell Street and then one on on Harding Avenue and the beacon portion is kind of hard to see in this photo but it's right right here that flashes uh, once the pedestrian activates that uh, we uh, met with air or we discussed this with airs uh, this afternoon and uh, Leoness our traffic uh, our transportation engineer uh, feels comfortable with the re recommendations that uh, uh, in terms of these these revised changes for this particular crosswalk the uh, in addition uh, uh, staff is recommending an ad another crosswalk that would be at this location right here uh, what the recommendation is to extend sidewalk from this from the east side of this driveway over to the east property line uh, and then with the with the plans that eventually staff will recommend a sidewalk on the south side of Roosevelt going over to to State Street and as part of that then a pedestrian ramp uh, at this location here that would extend north to connect up with the sidewalk on on the east side of Park Avenue located at this uh, point here in terms of landscaping, uh, the landscape plan shows a mixture of uh, street trees and shrubs, uh, shrubs uh, as well as uh, planting beds along the foundation of the building. And also, as I kind of had alluded to, there's a variety of pavement materials and textures that are also pro proposed uh, with a fairly extensive uh, plaza area uh, located to the west and the south of the building here that overlooks uh, Little Niagara and, and then uh, Putnam Park located right there. Uh, lighting for the site will include a variety of fixtures including uh, pole mounted lights that would be for the, the parking lot and then a series of pedestrian or bollard style lighting for the plaza areas and those would be need to meet with the city's uh, exterior lighting standards uh, the site plan also shows two decorative walls in the front of the building uh, one would be located right here and the other would be located right here uh, the walls uh, would be internally lighted with LED fixtures uh, due to their proximity with the residential neighborhood uh, the lighting should be subdued uh, not cast glare and uh, not change in brightness or in color in terms of building elevations and these are in your packet Uh, this is the ele elevation of the building uh, looking from the intersection of Roosevelt and Park you can see again the two-story building uh, with the variety of uh, brick and glass that is uh, very similar to a lot of the other campus buildings uh, another elevation this looking from the campus looking back towards the southeast uh, this is an event area up here on the second floor here that has glass on on all three sides in terms of the the north uh, west and the south uh, so it would have nice views of the the plaza area that overlooks the park and nice views of the park itself in, in that particular area and then this is looking straight west at the building 
again with this event area up on the second floor with the windows again overlooking uh, Putnam Park and this is a better view of the plaza area here uh, this actually shows to it what how the change in the, the crosswalk would be rather than having the crosswalk in this area here crosswalks going to be more in, in this vicinity right in this area right here which will provide uh, again as I mentioned a shorter distance for the pedestrians to cross that area there are some um, floor plans that were also included this is the uh, first floor plan first floor uh, most of the public areas are to the front of the north in this area here uh, with an entrance here entrance here uh, a larger presentation area here again with the plaza area overlooking the park and then the back portion with, is more of the office areas but again even with that there's a number of windows that are in the back facing over the uh, the park area and then this is the second floor uh, again what the more of the public areas in this area here with you know, this larger event area that I had alluded to before with windows on all three sides overlooking the park and then again with a series of windows in the back for some of the office areas the uh, there also would be a sign for the building the sign would be located right in this area here and that would be re reviewed with permit the proposed rezoning and site plan is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan uh, which shows the area as appropriate for school and university use and also the third ward neighborhood plan also shows this area as part of the university campus uh, just a couple things in closing uh, regarding drainage uh, the project narrative describes uh, stormwater treatment methods as a sheet flow with a biofilter that would be located between the building and the creek so in this area here uh, there would be a biofilter uh, that would catch that storm drainage uh, before it got in, into uh, Little Niagara filter that uh, uh, so it'd be located in this area right in right in here the uh, stormwater management report and stormwater calculations will need to be submitted to our city engineering uh, department for approval uh, regarding traffic the traffic generated by the proposed improvements uh, would remain relatively constant uh, uh, based on the current conditions uh, based on the information provided by heirs associates there are no new staff or departments planned to occupy the vacated areas of Schofield Hall and essentially the operations that are occurring within the visitor center are already occurring at other locations on campus uh, the site is serviced by several bus routes and the project uh, does not anticipate to change that demand for transit uh, the waterways and parks commission uh, and plan commission uh, both have recommended approval of the rezoning and site plan uh, the conditions recommended by the plan commission are included in a uh, cover letter that was included in your packet i won't go through those specifically as i've kind of alluded to those in my presentation uh, the one addition that we would have would be just that we would want to see a revised site plan showing that uh, revised crosswalk. Uh, with that, if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Pat Ivory. Council members have questions regarding the presentation. Council Member Gregor. Uh, thank you, Acting President Worthman, and thank you, Mr. Ivory. Uh, I guess I was yeah, I'm really pleased to see, like, I guess these revisions based on some of the concerns that we raised at Plain Commission of the crosswalk on the the west end of the property. And I guess I was wondering about clarifying um, whether that crosswalk would be just painted or would it be, would include those those paver bands that were described kind of flowing from the, from the plaza out toward the central campus? Uh, we do have representatives from Ayers and the university here tonight to talk a little, little bit about it but it's my understanding that it'll be a, a painted crosswalk uh, and then within the outside lines there will be blocks to, to further uh, highlight that crosswalk okay. thank you thank you uh further questions council members have on this i'll see any. thank you do would the applicant like to come forward first to present on this it's not necessary but if if um, someone would like to come forward from heirs or from the university welcome 
Good evening. I'm Angie Goodwin with Ayers Associates. We're here representing the university. Also with me tonight is Mike Rindo with the university and Travis Schrader, our architect. And I think Pat did an excellent job of covering the project, but we're certainly here to answer any other questions that you might have for us. Um, Jeremy, uh, Pat's discussion of that crosswalk, it is planned as pavement markings, um, but, but the heavier blocks going across there while the other uh, crossings were just planned as outside lines, but that's our primary one, so that would be a heavier pavement marking. Thank you. Um, do council members have any other um, questions? I don't see any. Thank you again. Thank you. And are there folks here this evening that would like to specifically speak on this agenda item? Again, this is, uh, if you could come forward, um, this is the visitor center and admissions, um, a rezoning uh, on uh, Roosevelt Ave. Um, welcome. I'm uh, Sharon Hildebrandt. I reside at 426 Summit Avenue. Um, just a couple of things, uh, the council, as you consider this ordinance, um, I think I'm correct in saying that uh, as a third ward residence too. This will be, uh, I believe, the, the, the most significant structure the university has built that will have an imprint this far east into the neighborhood. And it's a large structure. So as you're considering this, um, a couple of things came to mind. One is that the landscaping buffer between where the parking is planned and the next residence, which has, by the way, historical significance. It's a unique his architectural property. Um, I believe the Larson zone, that building. Um, to be aware of that, that buffer zone, um, I think it's gonna be critical to designate, you know, a public university from the residents that live there. The lighting, I think, uh, we've had the experience on uh, Summit, where it was rebuilt there, going into park when they put the median in there. That light was way too bright initially, and still, I think, uh, is too bright and too much light. So again, sensitivity to the fact that you're in a residential neighborhood here, and um, this lighting has to be um, thought through and considered and hopefully not be overly um, intrusive on the neighbors. Um, I had a question as to, uh, just a thought, I'm not quite sure um, why uh, the access to this is gonna be a problem. I think that's a given. Um, and signage is going to be necessary. So I'm kind of curious as to where the signs are planned to be placed, if we're gonna have those on State Street, again, surrounded by houses, um, or on Park, coming into it from the north. So I want to know if the uh, council is gonna consider that and um, how that looks in a residential neighborhood when you have a you know, four by eight sign over your house. Um, and then also just curious uh, to hear from the university if you had ever considered putting this on Hibbard where you had full access from State Street. That seemed to me to be a, um, you know, something that would have been a perfect site. So just some thoughts on that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Holderbrand. If you could just wait for a sec mm -hmm. if uh, council might have any questions. See any. Thank you again. Anyone else here this evening to speak on the uh, rezoning? for the admissions and visitor center. Welcome. Hi, Kevin Rosenberg, 219 McKinley Avenue. Um, I chair the uh, Third Ward Neighborhood Association. And uh, we don't have any problems with the, um, the visitor center. We're <clears throat> happy that the university changed its uh, master plan and decided to build this instead of the uh, dorm that was, uh, that they looked at about six years ago. Um, the only issues that, uh, that we have are uh, the State Street reconstruction is going to be going on at the exact same time as this building, and the people that live on Roosevelt <clears throat> are going to have to travel down and around Park Avenue here um, to get out of their, their houses. So with this construction going on here and on the other side, uh, we'd hope that uh, um, the residents would be taken into uh, account when that happens. And that's all I have. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Rosenberg. Any questions? I don't see it. Oh, hang on a sec. Uh, Councilmember McGregor. Thank you, Acting President Worthman, and thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. Um, do, what are your thoughts on the lighting and how that can be as reasonable as possible for the neighborhood? Well, I would echo what uh, Sharon said just a, a few seconds ago, that uh, the lighting on Summit was, uh, 
was not very good for the people that lived there when they first came up. And I think they, they got the lights dim now. But if you look down Park Avenue, uh, when those new lights went in, it looked like a football game was going on at night. And uh, there was a lot of light trespassing into people's houses. Uh, people showed me pictures of what that looked like, and it you know, wasn't a good thing. So um, with the new LEDs, that's something that we're a little bit concerned about till people get a good idea how to operate those. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments on this agenda item, the admissions building? Anyone else want to speak on this item? Good evening. Mike Grendo, Assistant Chancellor, UW-Eau Claire. Just to, uh, to clarify the question from Ms. Hildebrand, uh, the university did originally in its master plan have the location of a new, very small and modest um, welcome center at the corner of State and Garfield. Um, when we reviewed the master plan about five years ago, and as um, was just mentioned by the previous speaker, there was some concern by the neighborhood about the location of a possible modest residence hall there. Uh, we revisited that master plan and then made the determination that the site that we want to build this visitor center on now and welcome center would be the next best and highest use of that parcel of of land, so we made that adjustment and then moved forward with the with the welcome center plan. Thank you, uh, Councilmember McGregor has a question. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, Acting President Worthman, and thank you, Mr. Rindo. I was wondering about um, any conversations that may have occurred since Plan Commission last week regarding the sustainable design elements and working with the Student Office of Sustainability on landscaping or on the um, potential of having uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Do you think you could give us an update on that? We, we did have a follow-up discussion with uh, leadership of the Student Office of Sustainability uh, for the Council's information. The students pay an annual segregated fee that goes toward sustainable initiatives on campus, and so they have funds that are available to be able to do sustainability initiatives. And we've had conversations with them about landscaping uh, around the Welcome Center, uh, specifically with them contributing the trees, and also a, uh, an electrical vehicle charging station, which will, there, there will be infrastructure for, and the, and the students are interested in putting in a uh, vehicle charging station. And the other thing we've talked to them about is, is um, looking at whether there might be some LEED certification. Um, that gets complex because it has to be built into the design, and then it's got to be verified by engineers, but those, that kind of discussion is ongoing. Uh, Council Member Beaton. Thank you. Could you speak um, more about the um, buffer zone, um, uh, landscaping buffer zone between this project and the neighboring home that was mentioned? Well, I think there'd be appropriate plantings there, and we'd work with city staff to ensure that that were the case. Can I have a follow-up? Sure. Um, it, do you anticipate um, working with the homeowner, the neighboring homeowner on that, um, to, to make sure that it's going to be... We can certainly have uh, conversations with the Larsons. They're right next door, and, and uh, their property directly abuts the university, so we'd be glad to have a conversation with them about it. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. Any further questions? I don't see any. Oh, yeah, Council Member um, Anderson. Uh, thank you, um, Acting President Worthman, um, and thanks for coming today. Um, I just wanted to follow up on a question um, that was raised earlier regarding signs and if there's any plans for signage on State Street or in the neighborhoods that would direct people to this or if that has not come up in conversations. So signage to the university would, um, I presume, be part of the State Street redesign with the roundabouts that were approved by the council and giving people who are coming into campus a, an opportunity to understand, you know, what, where they would need to turn to, to enter into campus. In terms of campus, anything along Roosevelt Avenue, the campus doesn't put those kinds of signs up. We put signs up on our campus proper, and, and so we have signage standards that um, if you've come to campus recently, you would recognize with post and panel signs that are in front of our buildings, as well as signage that is mounted on our buildings, and that is our campus standard, and we would follow that campus standard. So there would be a sign in front of the building. Thank you. Thank you. Don't see any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Rindo. 
there anyone else here this evening who wishes to speak on this admissions building, the rezoning for this admissions building? Welcome back. Thank you. Pat indicated it was okay for me to come up sure. here again. So, And I just wanted to um, work with Mike here to clarify a couple of things. So on the screening, what's currently in the landscape plan that was submitted to the city is two rows of some shrubbery along there. The back row is a five to six foot high um, type of plant, and then the front row is two to three feet, and we'd be... We've tried to keep three or four of the larger trees that are right near the property line there very intentionally to try to keep that screening. And then um, what's really what's being taken out is some very overgrown, pretty ugly looking greenery there. So we're replacing it with a similar size, but a much more neatly planned um, system there as part of the reconstruction. Um, Mike talked quite a bit about the signage on State Street. The signage plan for the building is there's signage on the building, on the upper part of the building that meets the city, um, you know, requirements for signage, and that was included in the submittal. And the only sign in front of the building is a small parking lot sign, just like all the other parking lots on campus that would just identify for people which parking lot they're entering. Um, so that is the signage. Um, the lighting, um, we don't do the lighting design, but I know the lights designed around that parking lot are 12 foot tall lights. So they're pretty short lights for a parking lot because it's a pretty small parking lot. And so we don't have any big tall lights like you see in some of the bigger parking lots around town. They're only 12 feet high, which is actually shorter than all of the pedestrian lights through campus. The pedestrian lights through campus are 14 feet tall. Um, so that is the lighting along the lot, and I know the lighting designers were very sensitive to that light spill and being sure that we're meeting city requirements and looking at what those lighting levels are at the property line. So it's very intentionally been brought um, to be careful with that lighting. I think that covered the questions that I wanted to. Okay. Thank you. Do council members have any further questions? I don't see any. Thank you again. Then is there anyone else here this evening to speak on this issue? If not, we will close that item and move to item number three. This is our public hearing on rezoning property located at 1106 Mondovi Road from C3H to C3P. This is in file Z164319. Mr. Scott Allen, good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Acting President Worthman and members of the council. Again, before you this evening is a request to rezone 1106 Mondovi Road, which is the Artisan Forge property, uh, from the current C3H, which is the Highway Commercial designation, to C3P, which is uh, commercial with uh, planned development, and adopt the uh, general development plan as well uh, related to that uh, with the site plan specifically related to setbacks. start with this one actually see here again this is the uh, property in question at the uh, corner of Hendrickson Drive which is uh, Highway 37 and Claremont Avenue uh, this shows a little bit the uh, current thank you the uh, current setback identified at uh, 70 foot line here and then there's some modifications to the setback uh, with uh, previous uh, variances uh, uh, to this property, primarily in this area. And again, you can see how the setbacks vary somewhat based on the, its frontage along the various uh, rights of way there. The property itself is uh, about 3.4 acres. Uh, the applicant, uh, Mr. Greg Johnson, is requesting to rezone the property uh, in order to allow for the construction of a canopy and outdoor seating structure to the north of the existing building. This is in uh, the packet as well. It's very small in this overall site plan, but just to show kind of generally its relation to the existing building. This shows a little bit more where that would be located in the existing uh, landscape area again immediately to the north. Again, here's, here's the aerial, uh, most current aerial with, again, uh, the northern portion of the building being the area in question facing Claremont Avenue. 
Uh, the required setback, as I showed uh, just briefly, uh, along Claremont Avenue is 70 feet. The applicant uh, has requested a reduction uh, to 20 feet, uh, which would primarily allow for possibility of installing a pole sign closer to Claremont Avenue. Uh, site plan shows a covered structure that would extend out from the north wall uh, of that building, as noted here, uh, 12 feet 4 inches, and have a width of approximately 50 feet. Let's zoom out here. Some uh, just sketches of that proposed uh, outdoor seating area. The uh, structure would prov provide outdoor seating for uh, the new Skillshot coffee bar. Uh, again, as referenced uh, earlier, uh, Plan Commission has made uh, some approvals uh, prior to this uh, for various expansions, modifications to the building, including uh, site plan approval for expansion of the building back in 2016. At that time, that included a two-story portion of the building, again, located at the north side here with parking lot uh, expansion. Uh, that site plan also allowed for the display of the sculptures they see on the north side of the property. Mm -hmm. uh, the proposed uh, seating area uh, would be, again, adjacent to this most recent expansion from 2016, as shown located in that landscape area. It would not impact on-site vehicle circulation or parking, adequate vehicle parking is uh, provided on site to accommodate what uh, would really be more of a seasonal use. Uh, staff uh, supports reduction the setback to allow for the construction of this restaurant seating. However, uh, staff has recommended that reduction of the setback be limited simply to the structure at this time. Uh, Plan Commission also uh, was uh, had consensus in the same fashion and has recommended approval of the amendment to allow for this outdoor uh, seating area to extend 12 feet, four inches from the north wall of the building at a setback of not less than 60 feet. So rather than going to the 20 feet, uh, the Plan Commission staff uh, rec have recommended a 60 foot uh, setback at this point, and again, specifically related to this outdoor seating area. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, uh, reducing only uh, or the setback only for the applicant's parcel uh, from 70 feet to 20 feet would be a uh, rather piecemeal approach. Uh, rather, uh, staff, again, is recommending uh, a little bit more larger scale, kind of, say, regional, but uh, area-wide uh, revisions and considerations uh, to the setbacks for other businesses and uh, properties in the area. Uh, in fact, uh, staff brought this item that specific item to the plan commission at their March 4th meeting, where it was uh, again discussed uh, to look at a more comprehensive review of the corridor prior to uh, modifying uh, the setback any further than what's recommended before you here this evening. So with that, again, uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Are there questions from council on this rezone request? questions I have a couple sure um, just so I understand is that part of the increased setback request is is specifically for the sign is that is that correct that that was the, the distance is really to include a sign the applicant was uh, primarily and if uh, I didn't see if mr. Johnson was here uh, primarily related to uh, the sign uh, mm -hmm. the interest in the sign uh, again because the uh, he did say, I guess, to allow for future opportunities as well. So kind of just thinking ahead, planning ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Johnson did note at the plan commission meeting uh, last week that uh, uh, he is interested in a uh, rather uh, rapid uh, comprehensive review, as I noted, of the, of the setbacks in the area. And again, mm -hmm. as I mentioned uh, back at the first meeting in March, plan commission had that discussion. Staff is doing some research as we speak. So we hope to have something back before you uh, sooner rather than later. And that kind of leads to my next question is, I know that there was a master plan that came forward for this specific corridor. I'm assuming that this request and the sign request kind of play into that plan. Are you aware of that? Uh, specific to 
uh, um, something related to the setbacks or? I believe we had a plan that was actually with the university, with the hospital, the bid, um, the hospitals, and we'd reviewed that maybe. maybe Mr. Maybe Ivory might be able to answer that. Five years ago. I mean, Mr. Ivory. It's very remember. fortuitous. Uh, Mr. Ivory is present here this evening. So. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, yes, there was a, a plan that was put together f for this general area. Uh, when we looked at that for some guidance, that actually did not delve into the setback issue, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. It looked more in terms of uh, circulation for uh, some road connections over by the Marshfield Hospital area. Okay. So uh, that didn't really help us too much in terms of providing that guidance, so that's why we'll have to do further research. Okay, that helps. Thank you. Council members have any other questions of Mr. Allen or Mr. Ivory? Uh, Council member McGregor. Thank you, Acting President Worthman, and thank you, Mr. Allen. I was wondering about, I know that there was a previous um, allowance of, of sculptures in the setback area. Could you describe how that came to be and how that should be considered as part of this? Uh, simply noting the fact that back in 2016, uh, the site plan for that expansion of that northern portion of the building that we're referring to here uh, tonight did include uh, the display of the sculptures specifically or I guess more, more generally as part of the landscape area so that was the provision or exception for lack of a better term at that time thank you any other questions from council seeing none thank you mr. All right Allen. thank you are the members of the public here this evening who would like to speak on the rezoning request up on Mondovi Road and the setback? Are there any members of the public here this evening who would like to speak on this issue? Seeing none, we will close the public comment period for that item and move to our public discussions period, the meeting. This is uh, item number four on our agenda, Park Open Space and Recreational Facilities Plan. Namely, this is a discussion to amend the 2018 to 2022 Park Open Space and Recreations Facilities Plan to classify 111 Niagara Street as a special park and open space area. This evening we have Mr. Pippinger to present. Good evening. Good evening, Acting President Worthman, City Council. Before the City Council is a request to amend the 2018 to 2022 Park and Open Space and Recreation Facilities Plan to classify the parcel located at 111 Niagara Street to a special park and open space area. Mr. Ivory did talk a little bit about the rezoning part. The National Recreation and Parks Administration has the standards and criteria used for classifying park spaces and, and identifying this parcel as a special area is appropriate for this space. There are several different criteria uh, from play lot to neighborhood park, urban park, community park. We're looking at the special area of the classification as being most appropriate. As part of the parks and open space plan, uh, part of uh, where this would be located would be on the urban park special area athletic field would be within this area here that we'd be identifying. In 1997, the city purchased several parcels located at 111 Niagara Street to remove structures that were built in the floodplain. These properties were purchased with FEMA funding to turn into green space. This parcel is approximately one acre in size. Uh, Mr. Iver already talked about this area here that is currently being used as a parking space, uh, primarily for, my guess would be students at the university use it for a, a, a way to get across the uh, footbridge to their classes. Um, the Waterways and Parks Commission and Plan Commission recommended approval at their last meetings, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Pippinger. Council members have questions on this item? Questions? I don't see any. Thank you again. Thanks for your work on this. Then are there members of the public here this evening who would like to speak on the um, designation of a special area in our parks and open spaces plan? This is on Niagara Street. The 
between Niagara and Chippewa. Is there anyone here this evening to speak on this item? I see none. Uh, we will close our public discussions period then and move to our public comment period. I want to just give a little bit of background so folks uh, know what, what is expected in this time. So first and foremost, um, if, if you would like to speak during our public comment period, please make sure to sign up um, at the back of the room. Has everyone had a chance to sign up? Hopefully you have. If not, we're still going to allow you to come forward. Um, you just have to state your name and address. Um, speaking turns are three minutes on this public comment period. It's for 20 minutes, um, but it can be extended by the chair with two-thirds concurrence of the council. Um, and we've done that in the past if there's a lot of folks who wish to speak. Um, I just want to uh, touch on briefly um, that because of open meetings law, um, we're not, council is not allowed to um, give feedback or answer questions specifically because these are things that have not been noticed um, ahead of time. So because of open meetings law, uh, we have to limit that. Um, but what we do want to hear is your ideas and perspectives on uh, issues that are impacting your neighborhood. Um, a few of the things that we limit this to, just specifically, that the comments uh, and ideas have to be about uh, a sort of a citywide uh, application. What, what is not allowed is for uh, personal um, complaints of either city personnel or of city council members um, or elected officials or those affiliated with the city. Um, so the other thing that we don't allow is if you have a specific citation, like you've got a parking ticket and you're concerned about that. Um, it has to be broader than that. It has to be about things that are uh, in, a, in a broader way impactful in our community. Um, so the second point um, is that, uh, again, comments shall not be um, on any items that were already heard on the agenda earlier. So you can't speak on any of the items that we already talked about on the agenda, again, for open meetings law compliance. Um, lastly, that comments should not be profane, disruptive, threatening, or conducted uh, in, in an uh, otherwise, uh, in a fashion that would be uh, impeding of the safety and, and orderly conduct of this meeting. Um, and so, again, if you have uh, questions for council or questions for staff, those will be answered, but they can't be answered in the meeting uh, during our public comment period. So uh, with that said, um, we will start off with our, our 20 minutes and begin with uh, Mr. Peterson. Welcome forward. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dave Peterson, and I just want to be brief and address the council to a particular issue that's uh, something I have a concern. I want to address the council's desire to celebrate the Eau Claire's railroad history, which can include the proper disposition of the 2719 in its future. I hope that the resolution uh, that you will review tomorrow will ensure that the 2719 fulfill its full potential. I wish to preserve the locomotive in a manner that it reigns, remains operable, and in the event it, um, it should occur, return it to the Chippewa Valley on occasion to operate. I'm here to keep the dream of many volunteers, donors, and the Chippewa Valley Railroad to return the 2719 to operation after its 15-year inspection uh, can be completed. Remember, it is they who raise the money and put the effort to restore, rebuild, and operate this locomotive, and then continue to help operate it in Duluth until its flu time was up. Through this process, the city, none of the residents put any money into this project through uh, the city um, uh, funds. We need a plan to get the locomotive running again. I propose that the city negotiate a plan with the Lake Superior Railroad Museum, who's now the, uh, the engine is located, and those who did the work and gave the money, like the Chippewa Valley Railroad here in Eau Claire, and all kinds of donors that gave over, over $90,000 to match the, the grant from the state, and the volunteers that looked after this engine for 40 years to continue this stream. I have already also have proposed to a few people in town an alternate to the 2719 to preserve railroad heritage. 
This is a celebration of the Chicago Northwestern 400, for which this town was uh, one of its main stopping points. And I would be happy to discuss this with the council at a later date. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Peterson. Next up on our list this evening, we have Ms. Weikert. Good evening. Welcome. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Liz Kennedy Weikert. I live in the third ward at 304 Roosevelt Avenue. That is right at the corner of State and Roosevelt and one of the properties in the way of the proposed roundabout set to be constructed in 2020. I'm here today to ask City Council to revisit this decision to construct, to construct a roundabout. I'm against this plan for several reasons, only a few of which I will address today. The, I feel the process by which the Roosevelt decision uh, was made is flawed. but. That is not what I'm here to focus on. I'm focusing on the property value of the four homeowners at the corner of State and Roosevelt. None of us were properly consulted about the amendment that was presented on March 12th. When none of us in the third ward on the association had a chance to review the plan before it was put before council and approved. My property specifically will have all of that State Street traffic coming down the hill and shining lights into our home. Here is a photograph. I don't know if that's upside down. It, it'll just focus in a second. Okay. Sorry, I had to blight out the kids' faces. This is a photograph of any day of my home in the summer. There are always this many kids right there. This is where the roundabout will start for State Street. This is no longer a safe place for these children to play. They hold lemonade stands there. They put a slack line up there. They ride their bikes. They ride their skateboards. They draw a sidewalk chalk. This is gone. This is no longer a part of their every day. And these aren't just my children. These are children throughout the whole neighborhood. Second, and so my kids are told to be very careful when they're playing here. And now I'm not going to be able to allow them to play in my front yard at all. Council members, I ask you to revi revisit this. The threats of eminent, eminent domain that were made before any of the four of us were even contacted, I don't feel is wise for a council to make to citizens. I don't feel that it is wise to put a roundabout here without proper pedestrian crossing. It is made for a vehicular continuous traffic, not for friendly pedestrian traffic. That's, that's all I've got today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Weicker. Next on our list is uh, Bob Nelson. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Bob Nelson, and I live at uh, 315 Roosevelt Avenue and I've lived in that house for 47 years. I have crossed the roundabout, or I have crossed the, the intersection on Roosevelt and State Street, I estimate probably about 15,000 times during those 47 years. So I know a, a thing or two about that, about that intersection. So, I, but, so I'm here today to, to just say a few comments uh, with regards to this. I, I, the comments from, from Liz, I think, should be well taken. My concern is certainly two, twofold. The economic and the aesthetic impact that a turn roundabout will make on Roosevelt Avenue. And uh, secondly, about the pedestrian safety issue. First, first of all, the, the, the economic aspects. I think it's just, it, was, it just was not handled right in that the, the four homes on the corners were not notified, nor was the rest of us in the were the rest of us in the third ward really notified about the, the uh, addition of a roundabout on Roosevelt. A lot of us went to the information meetings in December. Discussion was made about the roundabouts uh, on Lexington and MacArthur and Hamilton, but Roosevelt Avenue was never mentioned. And then all of a sudden it appears as, as, a, as a thing that's going to happen. So I, I am I'm concerned about that and I'm concerned certainly about our young families, particularly the pictures that you showed, and, and I can attest to that 
as being a very active and vibrant uh, type of place for kids to play. And it's one of our great assets in our neighborhood is to have families there with kids. And, and they, do, uh, they, they do play, and there's lots of activity going on there. And so uh, I, um, I like to see that, and all of us would like to see it. We don't like to see property being taken from each of these corners. And, and that's, that's going to be certainly an impact on, on the, uh, those four houses. Uh, the house that Liz was talking about, I think, was the f first house on on Roosevelt Avenue. Our house just across the street was, I think, the third house. So uh, it's, it's a historic it's a historic home, and uh, we, we value the, the family concept there. But there's also other houses down, uh, up and down each area of, of Roosevelt that certainly can be affected by this as well. The aesthetic aspects, the, the light pollution, the things about about cars going around around the circle, and all of a sudden the headlights shining right into the right into your house, it's just it just doesn't seem like that's acceptable. And also the lights, perhaps overhead. Right now there's currently one light uh, at the intersection of Roosevelt and and State Street. I suspect that at a roundabout, if you look at some of the other roundabouts in the city, and I, I believe there, my, my wife went out and counted some of the lights and some of the roundabouts, and I believe there were about eight lights that Mr. lit up this, this whole circle. Mr. Nelson, it, if I could ask you to uh, conclude your comments. Okay, you okay. Three minutes. I will. I'm sorry. My, my background, I was a, made my living speaking, so I hard to. So anyway, proper, property uh, evaluation, I think, is really going to be affected by our residents. And pedestrian safety, uh, just to conclude, the Minnesota Department of Transportation has done some extensive studies on, on the traffic flow, and that's great. I'm all in favor of the, of the roundabouts, but I, I, uh, it's good for cars. But pedestrians, please take a look at pedestrian safety, and that's a big issue. Thank it's a big issue. So, thank you, Mr. Sorry. Appreciate it. Appreciate your comments. Uh, next up on our list this evening is Ms. Hildebrand. Sharon Hildebrandt, 426 Summit Avenue. Um, I'm addressing uh, the same issue that was brought up by the previous uh, speakers. Um, however, I want to illustrate something. So I'm going to show you the distance. Hey, do you want to hold that for me, please? I'm the house. You're the car. How many thousand a day? The house on the southwest corner of this planned roundabout is this close. The house on that corner, 13 feet, 8 inches, according to the engineer's plan that I requested. Thousands of cars a day between her and I. And the house, this is the building. The yard is somewhere your small yard now is somewhere between them. So I just wanted to illustrate what that looks like. That's one house. The others are also all moving their yards. The other issue I want to bring up is I spent a good part of today uh, reviewing um, the Third Ward Neighborhood Plan. This plan guides the neighborhood for the next approximately 10 to 15 years. And that neighborhood plan identifies, as well as the city's comprehensive plan, identifies some things about this neighborhood that I think need to be taken into account and should have been taken into account when you were thinking about the street reconstruction. Historic preservation, that's a given. There are only a few neighborhoods left in the city that have the integrity of the houses that the Third Ward have. Those four properties are contributing to that integrity. Parking congestion. The State Street reconstruction, we were, we were told not to address parking, and yet, and yet what's driving that reconstruction at that intersection is in part pedestrian traffic because there's an incentive to increase pedestrian traffic. The university and the city provide free parking on the east side of State Street, 
but permit parking, which you have to pay for on the west side. So if that wasn't addressed, and by the way, that's in the neighborhood plan and the comprehensive plan, to address, it's one of the goals actually in the neighborhood plan, it says to consider residential parking permits in that neighborhood. I don't know if that was discussed by the council, but it's in our third ward neighborhood plan. Reconstruct straight street following complete street standards. I'm sure that was applied. I'm sure these engineers, they've had a year. I know this has been a difficult task because it's a major reconstruction project for the city. But I think that the street standards that you're considering for that roundabout should be re-examined. I don't think that this is an appropriate place for a roundabout. Ms. Holderband, if I could ask you to One minute. conclude. Yeah, yep, you've, okay. you've gone past three. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, somehow in this process, and I think you're going to have others speak about this too, the wheels fell off. Somehow between January and February when the Third Ward Neighborhood Association voted against this, through our steering committee, the people that we tasked to speak for us, they voted 7-4 against it. Somehow, in a two-week period, not only did it come back for your vote, but it came back redesigned without reconsideration. So the wheels in this process somewhere fell off. We'd like to see you revisit this. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it, Ms. Hildebrand. Next up this evening, we have, um, it will be uh, Glenn, is it Glenn Mercer? Good evening, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Glenn Mercier. I reside at 1315 Hodgeboom Avenue. Now I'm here to tell you about choices, uh, choices that are made by individuals who ex experience a terminal or incurable diseases that cannot be adequately treated. Currently, the only choice is to wait for your own anticipated death from diseases such as cancer and heart disease. We need to think about choices that are supported by Wisconsin's Comp Compassionate Choices Act. Eau Claire is a great supporter of cancer treatments, heart trauma, and other survivable diseases. Our citizens support multiple fund runs and fundraisers every year. These events are necessary to fund research and support success for survivors and their families. However, there are no events that support the daily struggles of patients with, excuse me, with terminal diseases. How do you celebrate a terminal disease? You don't. We won't survive the cancer or disease that will eventually take our lives. It is so important to recognize that some patients will not survive and to allow patients to die with dignity, allow patients to make the choice of when to end their suffering, either in hospice or at home, and with the people they love surrounding them. This is an opportunity for Eau Claire to engage in research and a full discussion about compassionate death. The, the choice to make your own decisions on how to legally accomplish the end of pain and suffering for you and your loved ones. The choice to end the life with dignity and in peace. Allows family to and friends to manage the agonizing length of time, expenditure, and emotional capital with, while anticipating the inevitable loss of a loved one in a hospice care. According to a 2015 Gallup poll, 70, 70, Yes. Seventy-three percent of Americans are in favor to, of right to die or sometimes called doctor-assisted suicide laws in one form or another. The state of Wisconsin has introduced the Compassionate Choices Act nine times since the 95-96 session and the latest one being in 2012-18 session, all failing to get to the floor and, ironically, choosing to die in committee. Eau Claire can set an example for the state of Wisconsin by educating ourselves and supporting a non-binding resolution backing similar compassionate choices statutes that have been currently passed in seven states and the District of Columbia, as well as ten states that are currently taking under consideration passing legislation this year. The Oregon model of dying with dignity is what most states have emulated for their statutes. The rules for qualification as a, pa as a patient are similar in most states. Two oral requests to a qualified physician, a written request by at least witnessed by at least two people, and meeting the criteria of having a terminal or incur incurable disease as proven by the patient's medical history and a projected six months or less to live. This choice is not for all terminal patients, and many would prefer to let nature take its course but at least there is a choice to be given by developing a resolution here in Eau Claire that would be modeling 
compassion for terminally ill citizens, no matter what choice they make. Thank you, Mr. Mercier, for your presentation. Next up this evening, we have, um, I believe this is Stefan uh, Roman. I, I couldn't. Four four seven McKinley. Oh, my apologies. Ron Strong. Good Good evening. I can't read my own writing either. <laughs> I was trying to be careful, but uh, thank you for for uh, allowing me to come. And I wanted to speak about the Roosevelt Street uh, situation. And uh, I, I always wonder what kind of problem do we have? Do we have a civil engineering problem here? Or is there something else? It's already been mentioned. There's something wrong with the process. The process broke down. And I think that, uh, that I agree with previous speakers. Let's re regroup on this. That some of us have given months on this and listened to everything else. And I was the one at the last meeting of the steering committee, the elected committee of the third ward, to make the motion. And that motion was approved, and there were city council members there, seven to four. And that seven to four was that we adapted the, the engineer's recommendation. Now, did I like that? No. You know, I was excited when this first started. This was going to be, it was described to me as an arterial into our downtown, and our downtown being vibrant and people moving down there and things happening and celebration and so forth. And we could really make this a wonderful entry. Now, of course, we want pedestrian safety, of course. And, and of, of course, we went all these, the practicalities covered. But as the months went by, there was something that started to shift and shift. And I sat and listened for an hour. It was almost an hour. And there's other people here tonight that were, were, were with me on it. And it was real clear about this roundabout on Roosevelt. And there was a number of issues on it. But at the end of the day, the engineer said, we are not going to recommend it to the city. We don't want to get into private property issues and these other matters, and it's just not necessary. And many of us were, were, were strongly concerned about how this is going to affect. I live on the corner of McKinley and Roosevelt, and so we've talked about the specific corner, but the, the flow out of this is really something. And so uh, whenever I come here, I always think of Terry Sheridan. Uh, he was a mentor of mine. He was a wonderful man. Many of you knew him. Uh, he taught me to love Eau Claire. Uh, he also taught me to, to be prosperous here. I've got a yellow light. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, in, in listening to others, and when we spend money, it should make things better, not worse, for gosh sakes. We're talking millions of dollars. Let's make things better for people, not worse, okay? And he, he shared with me, I, I remember him once, that for every nut that we have, every problem that we're facing, there's a special wrench for it, okay? There's a wrench. And we can use the wrench of regulation. You know, we can strengthen our regulations. You know, the drunk walking around on Water Street regulations. We can strengthen them. And we, we get input and we fight about it and we come up with something better. Okay? And then we can also do enforcement. Gosh sakes. You know, let's put the parking police back in the third ward. How, you know, that was, that was a, a, you know, a real slap in the face for a lot of us, you know. And, and let's enforce speeding. Nobody wants people speeding down that hill. No, nobody does. Let's, there's their issues on it. But, but, but lastly, then we do the renovation. And so if we can regroup with you all, there's a number of us that rallied to your cause. You wanted the, the citizens involved. I want to represent Eau Claire, not just the Third Ward. You know, I, I want to see this thing done right. And I thought we'd accommodated a lot of the, the bikers and the university and everything else. So let's look at this as a governance issue. What went wrong? And we don't need to point the finger as much as let's regroup here and come forward with something I think that's a little more acceptable to all of us. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Rostrom. We have just reached our 20-minute um, mark. Um, I'm going to extend uh, the period for another 20 minutes. Um, is there objection from council of doing that? Is there any objection from council at this time to doing an extension? I see none. We'll extend another 20 minutes. Um, next up on our list uh, will, will be Sally Ronstrom. Good evening. Um, Welcome. Good evening, everyone, and thank you. 
Uh, my name is Sally Ronstrom. I live at 447 McKinley Avenue in the Third Ward. I've lived there for 20 years. Um, I was very surprised when there was mention of the roundabout on Roosevelt. Um, I know there's a lot of speeding going down the hill. Um, I know there's been raised concerns about safety issues. And, you know, uh, I listened, I was at the, uh, attended the Third Ward neighborhood meetings, um, some of them anyway, <laughs> when I could. And um, I'm, I hope that you will reconsider um, the plan because I think a lot of people really didn't understand in the neighborhood what was going to happen and how they would be affected. In fact, when I look at the plan now, it's a single, single lane roundabout. Whereas one of the meetings in, in January, uh, there, there was a, a consideration for a two lane roundabout where four houses would have to be demolished. And consider the price of that for the taxpayers. Consider the price. Um, um, I think that if the street was labeled, now if you're going to reduce it to a two lane, one lane going up and one lane going down, that would reduce the traffic or reduce the speed of the traffic. If you were to put signage up, such as the university had mentioned the speed light beacons, anything like that, so that people are aware that um, there is pedestrian um, traffic coming along. Um, if you, if you think of it, if you, if you can just imagine coming down the hill, we're entering the historic part of Eau Claire, and what, do we, what are we confronted with? An ugly roundabout. It's ugly. Why not put up some nice um, architectural signage stating you are now entering Eau Claire? Consider yourselves lucky because it's a beautiful, wonderful city, and we want to improve it. And to me, a roundabout at the bottom of the hill, ugly, ugly. Um, and not only that, but how it affect the neighbors. If you, if you think of a single roundabout, not only are you just feet away from somebody's home with traffic lights constantly looking in your window, how would you like that, really? Um, those houses, the value of those houses would decrease significantly. Already, we are challenged with rental properties in the neighborhood. And because we're an active um, uh, group, uh, we've been able to maintain dignity, uh, the historical nature of the, uh, and I, I see improvements all the time. I mean, a block away, somebody's probably invested $200,000 to take a home that has, you know, needed work. And they were willing to do it because the downtown is where people want to live. It's close to work. You know, it's desirable. You, Eau Claire is very unique in the fact that you can live less than a mile from downtown and have a, a wonderful neighborhood that you can walk in. So um, I'm suggesting that just, you know, if you're going to do the two lane, um, continue with that, put signage up, put a nice greeting sign, a beautiful, architecturally well done um, to, to welcome people to, to Eau Claire. And, um, Let's see what I was going to say about the roundabout. Um, Ms. Rostrom, if I could, if I could have you wrap up because you're, okay, you're just okay. past three minutes. All right. But anyway, what I'm saying is that we reduce the property values of those, especially those four homes. And once those, those properties are somewhat blighted, that blight continues. And that happens to be in a neighborhood where there's more single owner occupied homes. It's not like, you know, getting close to downtown where you have a lot of rentals. So we really want to maintain the integrity of that part of the neighborhood as being single family homes and not rental. And that blight would spread. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Next up this evening, uh, we have Mr. Torres. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Eric Torres. I live at uh, 1716 State Street, Eau Claire. First, I would like to thank you for uh, the work you do in the city council. I know it's not easy, especially when the line between the private and the public interest is blurred. Uh, I would like to express my concern and my opposition uh, to your decision to go ahead with a plan to put a roundabout at the intersection of State and Roosevelt. Um, 
this is a decision that goes against your own engineer's recommendation. I live on that intersection. I know the traffic flow and how it fluctuates at different times during the day. I'm here to ask you please to listen to your engineers and revisit your decision. If I may, uh, I just feel the need to say that this is not the wisest decision you can make. Um, there is, though, a stronger reason to oppose this project. I think it is not safe, and I think it is not uh, healthy uh, for the neighbors, uh, including the children who live in that intersection. Uh, it is not safe because it will bring an increased flow of traffic too close to our residences and green areas where children play. I have seen several accidents caused by impaired drivers that end up crushing on the trees in front of my residence. Your project calls for the, even for the elimination of those barriers that protect my family. It doesn't solve the speeding problem, and it creates a permanent safety hazard for our families. It is also unhealthy. The increased disturbance of unwanted sound, light, and noise pollution brought to our residences will affect our families' health, physical and mental, and the quality of our lives. Please notice that noise often affects children more than adults, but adults also suffer. And noise pollution also affects general well-being, including sleep patterns, productivity, and mood. As neighbors directly affected by your decision, uh, we have shared our concerns with uh, many of you in multiple opportunities during the listening sessions and in private conversations. Please listen to us. I'm here to reiterate them and ask you please to reconsider. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Torres. Next up is Mr. Weicker. Good evening, welcome. Hi, my name is Isaac Weichert and I live at 304 Roosevelt Avenue. Are you okay with the microphone? Yeah, if you could speak into the microphone, sorry. Okay. When I heard about this roundabout, I was very stressed because this will mess up pedestrian traffic and the Roosevelt, Roosevelt this spot of Roosevelt will not help people because these are circles make keep cars keep going, but it will not slow down traffic. But since there's a lot of traffic, cars are going to keep on continuous going, and it's going to make a huge, urge long thing of cars. And if someone tries to cross, the cars are going to stop, and all the cars are going to have to stop in front of it, or else all, each one will cross each other. And as me as a kid, right by that spot, me and my friends always cross that area to go each other's houses, and every day there's about, I'll say, 15 of us every day hang crossing that street, trying to, trying to go to each other's houses. If this roundabout is built, none of us can cross that street, and we have to go a few blocks to the side to cross there. And lots of kids who play or hang out there won't be, will be affected by this because they won't be able to have fun here or be ch do chalk or little kids cannot ride their bikes or skateboards. <sighs> and also, about this roundabout. Uh, Kathy Merle is going to help you. She'll put it on the, on the overhead. Sure. Thank you. This right here, it will be... So right here, when people are driving, and on this area, cars are going to be constantly going this way and this way, 
if someone tries to cross, there will be always constant borders, so people cannot cross and they'll have trouble crossing, because it's always 15 miles per hour cars going across, and it's going to be a big stretch of land, because usually cars go about pretty fast across there, and if you do that, it's going to make that cars probably hurrying up, and if a car tries to like turn into like this area, people there, if they see a gap there, they're going to try and s probably speed up to get in that gap, and a crash might happen if someone tries to turn at the same time. That won't be good. And if you think about bidding this roundabout, it's your choice. Me and my friends being safe, putting a traffic light with an island, or me and my friends being in danger with a roundabout. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Next on our list is Ms. Buckles. That's a hard act to follow, but I'll try. Um, my name is Laura Buckles. I live at 1604 State Street, a couple blocks away from the proposed roundabout. I would just like to echo my neighbor's request that the city council bring the large Roosevelt roundabout back for discussion. My point in doing so is to better evaluate the evidence that a roundabout is in fact a safe option for that location. So watching the video, um, I've seen this council lean heavily on the idea that speed reduction is the primary justification for choosing this big roundabout over the engineer's own recommendation and the third ward's clear vote seven to four. Of course, getting hit at 15 miles per hour is preferable to getting hit at 30 miles per hour. But that argument assumes that those are our only two options. How about the option of not getting hit at all? All other things being equal, reducing speed seems like a good idea, but all things are not equal here. Definitely not. We're introducing an entirely different design and neglecting to ask ourselves how a heavy volume of drivers, bikers, and pedestrians will behave in this new design. And that matters. What does the new design itself do to the likelihood that people are going to get hit in the first place? I've read that roundabouts actually increase the crash rate while reducing the severity of each crash. So it's potentially uh, we're going to have more collisions, but each one will be less extreme. Now that's just data on car on car collisions because there's really no good data on cars hitting pedestrians. But it's not a big leap of logic to surmise that a traffic feature designed to improve vehicular flow does not prioritize pedestrian safety. Saying it's okay because pedestrians can stop in the middle of the street while cars roll past on either side is not a comfort. And how severe have the accidents been at this corner? Not very. We've had no deaths anywhere on state going back to 1994 at least. At this corner in the past five years, we've had 12 fender benders, 10 minor injuries, and five bike and pedestrian accidents of unspecified severity. So when council votes against the engineer's original recommendation for this intersection by saying that speed reduction of the original proposal doesn't go far enough, I'm wondering how far is far enough and for whom? Reducing speed at all costs, in particular at the cost of destroying our, neighborhoods, our neighbors' property values and the integrity of the neighborhood and endangering the safety of pedestrians might be understandable if speed had actually been a primary cause of accidents at this corner and especially if the accidents had been severe, but according to the engineers, neither of these things are true. Engineering could not identify any particular pattern causing the accidents at this corner over the past five years, and I asked, it's a mishmash of things, speed is not a clear culprit. And so I don't think we can say for sure that reducing speed here to a rate only seen in active school zones is going to usher us into a new Xanadu of traffic enlightenment. The Third Ward Neighborhood Association was blindsided by the amendment put forth on March 12th. By being here tonight, we are simply asking for the chance to express ourselves that we are denied during the public meetings process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Buckles. Next this evening, Mr. Hennick. Good evening, everyone. Hey, good evening. Um, <clears throat> I came here to talk about something different. I um, was going to start talking about the bicycles in the, in the area, but something has happened this week that is putting residents in danger. We currently have ICE agents patrolling the Maples Trailer Park. 
and there's been three times that they've showed up. And what this is doing is just putting everyone on edge, and I think that our police force should get very involved in this to prevent gunfire from both the residents and, the, and ICE agents and, and create a safety issue. People are uncomfortable with unknown people walking in in the dark, and I'm just asking for the city to have our police department kind of intervene and create a safe atmosphere if they are going to, if ICE agents are going to get there, to have someone uh, be a damper. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henning. And last up on our list is Stacy. Um, you see Anchor. Thanks for waiting. Thank you for allowing me to speak. This is not my favorite thing to do, but <laughs> it is very necessary. I'm not a stranger to standing up for things because I'm a, not, a mom of three autistic boys, and so I've I know what it's like to fight for my kids, and I'm here to fight for my kids again today. I am that. I'm going to put a face to this house. This is me. This is where me and my three autistic sons live. This is my yard. This is where it will be. I don't know if you can see that, but that's 13 feet from my living room. That's my son right there in the window. Cars are going to be coming at us constantly. My kids are not going to be safe. I took this. It's been a beautiful neighborhood. They have embraced us with open arms. I'm a single mom of three beautiful sons, and it's, they've embraced me with open arms, and they've been very safe until I feel very unsafe with this right there in my, in my yard. Um, I see the traffic constantly. That's where I live, right there at the bottom. I've never thought that this is necessary. There isn't big traffic crashes or anything going on. Um, there, the few fender benders that I've seen right outside my window are because somebody's looking at their cell phone and there's a little bump, you know what I mean? I, I haven't seen any speed crashes going on. I have a son that takes a left to go to school every day at 7 in the morning. He does not have an issue. He takes a left every day, and that should be the most dangerous place to take onto that street. I'm very concerned. I'm, I'm a, uh, a citizen of this city. I, I grew up here. I went to high school here. I went to college here. I got my master's degree here. I, I teach here. I would like my kids to be safe here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else here this evening who would like to speak in our three-minute comment period? I think we have enough time for at least one more, maybe two. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't realize you were supposed to sign up in the back there. I'm Kevin Rosenberg, 219 McKinley. I chair the Third Ward Neighborhood Association. And uh, I'm asking that you open this roundabout issue up again. Um, the steering committee did vote 7 to 4, which is uh, you know, a pretty indi good indicator that uh, the neighborhood in general is against this. Um, the neighborhood vote that was on your packet when you voted for this was a random room filled with people. It'd be the same thing as if we just took and, and took a vote back here and then said, that vote is more important than the city council's vote. It's not. Um, further to that, <clears throat> the larger roundabout, which we never saw, um, I, I believe it was indicated that the neighborhood would be for the larger roundabout. And I actually think the neighborhood, the people that voted, the seven people that voted against the, uh, the roundabout, I think they were more against the larger roundabout because it would have taken somebody's yard away. And, and that's, that's just not typical of uh, someone that's going to be on the Third Ward Neighborhood Association. So not only are we not for the small one, but we're not for the large one either. I think we're more against the large one. And I, if we'd had more time, I'd like to go around the, the neighborhood and take a vote house by house because I'm pretty confident that this does not comport with, with our neighborhood, our neighborhood plan or anything. This, 
This is not what uh, you'd expect to see in a, in a Norman Rockwell type setting, which is the Third Ward neighborhood. So I'm just asking you guys just to give us a chance to, uh, to come back in here and, and readdress this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, we will then close our public comment period this evening. Thank you all for coming down. Um, seeing no further business before this body on a motion then by Council Member Weld, seconded by Council Member Beaton, this meeting will be adjourned. The Eau Claire City Council meeting will return in a moment. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. We now return you to the Eau Claire City Council meeting. Thank you all. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Anderson? Here. Beaton? Here. Berge? Here. Jefferson? Here. Amanda? Here. Drager? Here. Strobel? Here. Well? Here. Worthman? Here. John? Thank you all, and welcome everyone to our City Council Legislative Session this evening. Thank you everyone who's joined us. I want to first start off by thanking Valley Media Works for helping to live stream the proceedings of our city council meetings. That can be found on valleymediaworks.org, also on our government channel 99.4 on Charter Cable and simulcast on WRFP LP 101.9 FM. Past proceedings of our council meetings are also available on YouTube for, for folks who would like to check those out. Um, thank you again, everyone, uh, for your attendance this evening. We're going to go ahead and get started right away. Uh, we had our hearings last night. Um, but first up is our consent agenda, uh, item number one. And I will ask council if there's anyone who wishes to specifically remove any item from the consent agenda or has any questions uh, to clarify anything, anything on the consent agenda. Any desire to remove items? Seeing none, then on a motion by Council Member Strobel, seconded by Council Member Anderson, our consent agenda is, has been moved. Are there any comments? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Anderson? Aye. Aye. Berge? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Rager? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Well? Aye. Hi. John. So I apologize. I've noticed that that item passes. I apologize. I noticed that uh, when I turn on your microphones, it's been some static. Um, so what I'll do is I'll uh, if you if you put on your light to speak, we'll recognize you. But um, in terms of the roll call, I think we'll keep the mics off. Um, we'll work through it. Um, next up on our agenda this evening is our. Uh, Business agenda, this is uh, item number 16, special events, resolution authorizing volume one to conduct food truck Fridays, one Friday of each month in May, June, July, August, and September of this year along Riverfront Terrace in downtown Eau Claire. Mr. Pippinger, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Acting President Worthman, City Council. Um, the special event application before you is a repeat event with changes. Food Truck Fridays is an event that took place at the Railroad Street parking lot last year, and this year will take place in Phoenix Park next to the Great Lawn. Plan is to have the food trucks parked along the roadway here next to the sidewalk, and then there will be ample space for people to enjoy the park and also uh, the pavilion if. You've been to the Food Truck Fridays last year. Uh, I think three out of the events uh, had rain associated with them, unfortunately, but they were well attended. This event will occur on the first Friday of each month, starting on May 3rd through September 6th, 
One exception will be in July when the date will be on July 12th due to the, due to the July 4th holiday. Times of the operation will be from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. This event will require city council approval due to the more than 1,000 people are expected to attend this event. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Pevinger. Do council members have any questions regarding Food Truck Friday and this application from Volume 1? I see none. Thank you again. Uh, council Member Gregor, actually, uh, Mr. Pevinger, Council Member Gregor does have a question. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. And Mr. Pevinger, I um, just maybe I'm a little confused about the map that we have in, in the application that we have in the packet. It's showing the railroad lot. But yeah, this is an updated lot. They decided and they have changed the, the location to be at the RCU and off of uh, River Prairie um, Terrace. So that, okay. that was a change from, uh, from the original application. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Sure. City Manager Peters. Thank you. Acting President Worthman. Uh, in fact, Councilmember Gregor, that was one of the reasons we put this on the uh, business agenda instead of the consent agenda, is we viewed that as a substantial enough change that we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, there was a full transparency and discussion on, on that location issue. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, yeah, actually, my apologies, Councilmember Christofferson. Well, I, I don't have a question. I have a comment. I'm, I'm really very pleased to see the change of location because it was such a successful, popular event, but I thought it was really a um, pedestrian and traffic uh, snarl. And I think, I think this is going to be spectacular. Pleased to see that change. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, any further comments or questions? Seeing none, then on a, a motion by Council Member Emanuel, seconded by Council Member Weld. Item number 16 has been moved. Any comments? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Beaton? Aye. Berge? Aye. Christofferson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Gregert? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Well? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Jean? Aye. Anderson? Aye. And that item passes as well we will I wanted to make a comment actually moving back to our consent agenda um, just for folks that came this evening um, regarding the licenses on our consent agenda and uh, we pass all of those uh, in one group and I'll just mention that it, that includes license or licenses that were for quick trip for feed my people uh, for the greater Chippewa Valley uh, Boys and Girls Club as well as for um, butchers block uh, barbecue and as well for um, my office lounge, uh, which is um, on Galloway Street. So if your, if your um, item was in the consent agenda, we passed those um, together and just wanted to um, make sure to clarify that. So you're good to go. Um, moving on, we will go to our uh, item number 17 on our business agenda, which is licenses. <laughs> this, is an author, this is a resolution that authorizes Fermented malt, malt beverages for Carson Park Concessions Plaza, uh, Carson Park Football Stadium, uh, and the Jillian and Hobbs softball fields by the City of Eau Claire. Mr. Pippinger is sharing details. Before the City Council is a resolution authorizing the sale of fermented malt beverage for Carson Park Concessions Plaza, Carson Park Football Stadium, Galine and Hobbs softball fields by the City of Eau Claire. Fermented malt beverage sales have previously occurred through a private license holder, uh, Gary Martin, for the past 30 years. Very recently, Mr. Martin notified the city of his intent not to continue this, this service. Uh, an event scheduled for April 20th in Carson Park Football Stadium has requested the sale of fermented malt beverage. This is the Northern Cowboys. It's the semi-pro football team that will be playing in Carson Park starting on that day and uh, playing through the spring and early summer. Um, in order for the sales to occur, the city will need to provide this service. The city has already, already operates concession sales at this venue and has the capability of adding fermented malt beverage sales to our offerings. 
The city has taken steps of getting bartender license for our management staff and developed a policy of handling, serving, and managing the sale and operation of fermented malt beverages. The city intends to offer this service on a trial basis and may ultimately seek an agreement with a private license holder. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Piminger. Do council members have questions regarding this um, specific license? Council member Christopherson. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Mr. Pippinger, I'm, I'm just curious as to what, what is the additional responsibility or cost of the city in covering this service in the, in the short term? Sure. Um, the additional responsibility is to uh, have licensed bartenders, which would be our staff, and then uh, the servers, which would be our concession staff that are 18 or older. Um, and certainly, um, managing a crowd that is uh, in, in, in taking alcohol. I mean, that's uh, sometimes a different uh, uh, style and, you know, certainly uh, making sure that we're serving uh, people that are 21 or older and uh, making sure that people aren't overserved. So we are developing a policy to ensure that we don't have any of that. We're also following some of our special events policies as far as making sure people have wristbands that are, are old enough to drink and then also serving the alcohol with clear cups. Sure. So if I understand this correctly, it's, it's not an additional cost. It would be kind of a wash between having someone provide the service for the city or? Well, there'd be a, a, there would be an additional cost for supplies and the material, but that would be uh, recouped with the sale of the, uh, of the beverage. So that, that's really what this trial is for, is to just determine whether or not it's, it's beneficial. Thank you. Right. And it, it's a trial. Uh, it's, it's pretty much of a, a trial uh, type of situation, and we'll make a decision if it's worth our while to continue. Thank you, Mr. Preventer. Thank you. Any further questions on this license? I see none. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Preventer. Then on a motion by Councilmember Beaton, seconded by council member Chong. This is going to be moved. Are there comments? Any comments on this? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council member Berge? Aye. Chris Robertson? Manuel? Aye. Gregert? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Well? Aye. Worthman? Aye. John? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Beaton? And that item passes. We move to item 18 on our agenda this evening. This is an agreement, uh, namely a resolution approving 2019 to 2024 transit contract with the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. Welcome again, Mr. Pimenter. Busy tonight. Thank you. Go over a little bit about the history of the UW Eau Claire uh, transit agreement. The city and uh, UW-Eau Claire have partnered for a bus uh, agreement since 1997. There are two routes that this contract and agreement supports. It's uh, Route 9, which is the Water Street uh, area that services the lower campus in downtown Haymarket uh, Landing in Pablo Center and Randall Park, and then also Route 19 which is the Stein Boulevard service in the upper campus area by Imperial Circle. Um, with the agreement, it added these two routes, but we also added six buses to our fleet because of it. And that was uh, something that was uh, included in determining what the annual cost would be for the university. As far as UW Eau Claire ridership, since the partnership began, we have seen the uh, increase of ridership from 30 to 35 percent annually, uh, with a record high of over 365,000 trips in 2018. Looking at a little bit of a history of the ridership, um, from 2004 we had a little over 250,000 riders on from UW on these routes. And 
in 2018, as I mentioned, uh, have been our, our maximum of about 368,000. We did see this decrease here. This is kind of a national trend we saw for some reason from uh, 2015, 2016, 2017. Um, wasn't something that was specific to Eau Claire, but uh, nationally transit systems saw a decrease in ridership. And I've heard different uh, uh, thoughts on why that was, if it was uh, because of Uber and Lyft and those types of systems that uh, came into being during that time. Looking at a history of uh, the payments that have been paid in the past, this dates back to 2004 to current. And you can see in 2004, our, our payments annually were uh, less than 200,000. And in 2018, we were close to uh, 400,000. And this new contract, as you'll see, is that will take us to that 400,000 and uh, greater for the next five years. So the agreement for the term, it's a five-year agreement starting in uh, this fall in the 2019-2020 school year and ending after the 23 and 24 school year. The only change to the existing agreement will be Route 9 where we're increasing the frequency from to every 10 minutes due to the classes being taught at the Pablo Center. Um, the payment schedule over five years will be collecting over $2 million with this contract uh, for the next five years. I want to talk a little bit more about the service charges. I'll get into a little bit more about that agreement. It's based on four elements. The cost covering the local share for the hours of service provided. Cost for, to compensate for the loss of fair revenue, usually collected on transit routes. We know that um, in most transfer routes, we're collecting the, the fares. We would see more revenue coming in, so we compensated for that and added to the, the cost of the contract. Cost to offset some of the capital expenditures incurred in this, by the city. In this case, it would be the six buses. Uh, in this contract, we added, rather than diesel buses, we added hybrid buses uh, for the cost. And then also costs to offset some of the yearly maintenance fees in our bus tracking system. So students can actually go on their smartphone and actually see where the bus is on in live time. To look at a little bit, I don't know if you can pan out just a little bit on that. Okay, I think that's good. Um, looking at our 2019 budget, we took our budget for 2019, which was about $5.9 million, and we backed out the paratransit expense of about 1.3, which brought us the system expenses excluding the paratransit to about $4.6 million. Additionally, we backed out the federal and state aids of 55%. These are the aids that the city receives for our operating budget for, to cover our costs. And that came up to about 2.5 million, which in the end, the system costs after all the aids is about $2 million what it costs for us to, to operate our bus system. And that's the entire system. That's, not, that's including routes 9 and 19, but that's the entire system. So to figure out what the UW transit costs are, we took the, the total system revenue hours, and this would be for the entire city, is about 46,407 hours. And we divided that by the cost in our, for our entire system, that $2 million, and we come up with a cost per revenue hour of $44.63. Using that, and using what the transit hours, the 5,868 hours is the amount of hours that routes 9 and 19 operate. So we'll, we take that, multiply it by the $44.63, that gives us the UW transit costs that it costs us to run those two routes, which is 261898 The bus replacement, 
we included, this is based on four buses and two reserves with a 10 year life. We calculated at a 75% federal funding. Currently, we, we get a 80% federal funding uh, with the, the local share being 20%. So what we did, we didn't, we didn't take it completely up to that 80-20 because we don't know what the future is going to hold for us. Because if that changes, if that, that dynamic changes from what the federal pays us and what our local share would be, then we would be sitting with a five-year contract out so many dollars. So we calculated this at a 75% funding so based on that, that's $82,000 would, would be for that. And this is, a, again, on an annual, uh, annual rate. Um, loss fare impact. This gets a little bit more complicated how we figured this out, but it was actually taking a five-year average of the annual student ridership and taking a fourth of that average, which would be 64801 and taking the average fare this is taking basically all of our, our routes that we run in hours and what is taken in through uh, fares that we collect uh, from our ridership. And that comes out to 77 cents as an average. So we calculated the lost fare potential of, of running this system at about $50,000. So that was added into what the annual fee would be for the university. And then we have a maintenance on our bus tracking software. Um, again, students can determine where their buses are at any given time. And so the university, because their ridership is average around 33%, we, we charged, basically had a 33% of that $15,000 annual cost to 5,000. So total for the end for, the, uh, for this year, for the 2019-2020 year, it came up to $398,794. We rounded that up to $399,000, and here's an example of what the contract service charges are for the contract. Um, for 19 and 20, it's $399,000, and by the end that we get to 23 and 24 school year, it'll be up to 415,000 per year. Those are paid in three uh, installments through the year. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I thought I would have someone here from the university that uh, would be here, but they could not make it, so. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Pippinger. Council Member Beaton. Yeah, um, could you go back to the, the page with the yellow banner at the top? Sure. Um, the system cost after AIDS, the, the cost, it, that's basically the, um, the cost that the, that comes out of our budget, our operating budget, is that right? That $2,071,215? Some of that, not all of it, because we do collect fares. Okay. And so whatever the, the fares, right now I think our subsidy is around a million dollars a year for the, for the transit system. So half of that is uh, collected within fares. Um, and, and that's for what, a one year? Um, that, that two million is for one year, not for the five years, 2019 through? This, this right here? Okay. Yeah. This is just for the 2019-2020. Okay. This is what our budget would, would be. Okay, sounds good. Our total budget is actually here, but then we subtract all uh, yeah. the other aids. Do yeah. you have a follow-up? Yeah, I have an additional question. Sure. Um, uh, do you have an idea of how many total riders, kind of a ballpark that we have throughout the year? Yeah, that was in uh, that was in this graph here. We're last year we had three hundred and sixty-five thousand. Oh, you mean for the total, total system? City. Yeah. We're we're nudging around nine hundred thousand. Okay. for the, the entire system. Uh, our top year, Tom, correct me, I think we are over a million in one of our top years, but I think that number's coming up. No, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions on the contract? Council Member Emmanuel. 
Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, so this is a super optimistic question. What happens if Menominee Street is up and running sooner than we think in the partnership um, with the Y and kind of the university's footprint there? And there is a need to um, increase the route um, for students that are participating in some of those programs. What happens if that wonderful scenario were to occur before five years is up? We'd have to, just like we did with the last year, because we did increase the service to that Route 9 uh, because of the Pablo Center was, was holding classes there, they would uh, pay a, an additional fee for that service. So we would have to negotiate additional service for that area, and they would pay for that additional service. Sure. Um, as a follow-up, um, would that be negotiated before we would say that they would pay it? Like, would those terms come before the council, and the council then would decide? Not typically. Um, Tom, I think we do that internally. If that's, that's something that we work with the university in, in making that. It, it covers our costs. We make sure that it covers our costs, that if we have to extend additional service to an area. And City Manager Peters? I think if we look at uh, the last year with Haymarket uh, Landing coming on uh, line, that's a perfect example where uh, there was a change mid-contract in the university's need for more. Um, they approached us. Uh, we were able to you know, talk through what service levels that they were looking for. The nice thing about this agreement and the way it's structured and what M Mr. Pippinger just went through is the formula is basically there. Um, so, um, you know, it comes down to how many service hours are we adding and the formula is right there in the, in the agreement. Um, and so uh, certainly mid-contract, if there is that type of uh, adjustment or change, uh, we are willing and prepared and, and have in the past to sit down with the university and, um, and address those needs at, at that time when the change happens. Councilmember Emanuel, another Thank you. question? Thank you. Maybe I can ask a question to the city manager. Do you foresee then um, a contractual agreement or changes in coming before the council? Or in this case, you still think that this is administrative only in nature? So I, I believe, I, I want to go back and look, but with Haymarket, there was an amendment to the agreement. I mean, didn't we go back and adjust the agreement to add the Haymarket um, changes? Tom or Jeff? I don't think so. I think we did administratively. Okay. Um, I guess it would depend on the magnitude of the change um, and the language of the agreement and whether there's that flexibility in the agreement to add the service. Again, based upon the, um, we've, we've already established what the unit rate is, um, and uh, uh, but I guess we would have to look at the agreement and if it was viewed as a substantial change to the agreement, then that would come back to council. And we, Does that help answer your question, council member? And we would typically be using these numbers. Um, this is something that we'd be using uh, for any additional services. I think it answers my questions enough and I can save anything else for the comment period. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? I think I saw one over here. Was it Councilmember Strobel or Councilmember Anderson? No? Okay, Councilmember um, Christofferson. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Mr. Pippinger, um, the contract has such um, detail and, and really shows our interest in serving and protecting the students. I just want to, maybe this is actually a comment instead of question, but I'm, I'm curious about the information on marketing and promotion and um, wonder if you can give me any background on what that conversation was about marking city buses. I would maybe ask uh, our transit manager. Uh, he handles our marketing part of uh, in regards to our transit system. Mr. Wagner, if you could come forward. Thanks. Uh, in the agreement, um, item number 12 addresses the marketing, 
And uh, essentially, we work with the university um, in providing materials for the students. Um, and also, we, in our marketing approach, through our marketing budget, um, work at um, publications that would be geared towards the university students where we thought that was applicable. So that's kind of our approach in that manner. I don't know if that answers your question well, specifically. It, it clarifies. So these, these are uh, materials that are on the bus and not marking the outside of the bus? That's correct, yeah. They're, they're materials that are distributed to the university and, um, and also on the bus. You know. Does that help answer your question? Do you have a follow-up? Yes, Council it does. Member? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilman McGregor. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Thank you, Mr. Pippinger. I was, uh, I guess I was kind of wondering about the, um, the student input side of this and how that is, how that is gathered and, and um, I understand that the university did some sort of transportation survey within the last few years and I'm not sure if survey data is is used as a as a form of, of input from students, but um, could you describe the the process that you go through in order to to figure out what students feel are the needs and what the university administration feel are the needs in terms of changes from one five year contract to another? Sure. When we met with the university, we had uh, representatives from their their uh, management staff plus plus we did have one of the student senate uh, 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 representatives that were there during the negotiations and uh, besides that those meetings where we discussed these numbers and in the rest of the agreement, um, they had further discussions with their entire senate and I see uh, Mr. Rindo from the university just walked in, and he, he could perhaps elaborate a little bit on that part of it, but I, I can say that they were involved in our discussions uh, leading up to the tentative agreement. Councilmember Gregor, uh, did you want to get further clarification potentially from uh, Mr. Sure. Rindo? Sure, yeah. Mr. Rindo, would you be willing to shed some additional light on that? Did you hear uh, Councilor Bogart's I, I did. question? Uh, Mike Rendo, UW Eau Claire Assistant Chancellor. So uh, our student senate was uh, actively involved in the, in the discussions around this, really looking at not only at, at the past service, but what are the current needs of the university in terms of the students' uh, ridership patterns. So for example, the Pablo Center was not you know, open previously, and so we really looked at how do we serve Haymarket Landing, getting students to and from campus, uh, uh, Pablo, on, on a, on a uh, regular and timely basis. Same thing with uh, Route 9 and, uh, and, and the importance of having that circulator, especially during the winter. And so uh, the students gave it a, a great deal of consideration and, um, you know, the Student Senate is the duly elected governing body of our, of our students and, and so they weighed in on it and participated in, in the discussions and, and are very satisfied with the agreement that's been struck with the city. Councilmember, I have a follow-up question. Thank you. Um, I guess with regard to the um, the changes, um, my understanding is that Route Nine will have significantly more frequency than the um, Route Nineteen, which goes up the hill. And so that's an example of how things shifted. Would you say, in terms of student input, and then the new facilities related to off-campus housing or or the Pablo Center, for example? I would say your observation is, is correct. We also have other modes of transportation that we can use for getting students up and down the hill as needed. We have the campus cab, we have the conveyance vehicle. Uh, we also, for your information, have a shuttle that goes to and from the Priory on a regular basis during, during the day. So there's, there's a number of modes of transportation that the students can use. But, but primarily, Route 9 is, is really the, the main route that serves the student area. And, and so the f increased frequency enables us to move more students to and from uh, campus uh, in a timely manner. Thank you. Um, further questions, is this for Mr. Rindo? Council Marie Manuel. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rindo. So I'm, I'm curious about um, the engagement process if a, um, a 
contract uh, service modification were to occur to this contract, do you foresee that the student body, which changes every year, potentially will be engaged in future contractual changes? Oh, absolutely. The students pay a segregated <laughs> fee. That's how this is funded. And so not, not only is, is that something that's an expectation, it's a requirement. So the students have, have the ability to, you know, to be engaged in these kinds of uh, these contract negotiations on the use of their segregated fee money. Any further questions for Mr. Rindo? Um, let's see any. Mr. Rindo, thank you again for. Thank you. Sorry, a few minutes later. Uh, do council members have uh, any further clarifying questions for Mr. Pippinger before we close out the question period? Councilmember Emanuel. Thank you, Acting President. I guess um, this is probably a question that might potentially lead to an amendment. I'm looking in our packet on page uh, 75. It's the last page of the, um, the recitals. And it's under number 16, under entire agreement. It says, no modifications or waivers of the agreement shall be binding on either party unless confirmed in writing and signed by both parties. So I'm, I'm very sensitive to the fact that we have 10,000 plus students at the university with a dynamic um, governing body and wanting to make sure that their voices are captured and there's a there's really kind of, I guess, a pathway to the electeds if they feel like the negotiations aren't going the way that they necessarily maybe agree with. Is there somewhere here that we could add on something along the lines of, like at the end of that sentence, comma, um, including, you know, the city council or something like that, which I understand it, it says both parties and that suggestion's a little clunky, but where would be the appropriate place to add in um, making sure that the city council had an opportunity to weigh in if there was a change to this agreement? To, okay, uh, we're going to turn that question to our assistant city attorney, uh, Janessa. Sure. Um, so I would recommend that that be added as a separate provision, provision to the contract, not try and um, add it into paragraph 16. Um, if you're going to require that any amendments, you know, come to council or something like that, um, that would be my suggestion. Thank you. Um, council member, so um, that's a motion. You're making a motion then? You're not. Okay. I'll, I'll, would you like to continue? Okay. Um, does anyone else have, my apologies, we haven't moved this yet. Does anyone else have any questions um, regarding the contract, potential amendments? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Puppeter. On a motion then, this will be by Council Member Berge, seconded by Council Member Christofferson. Is that okay? Um, this item has been moved, transit, Agreement. Um, first up, uh, Councilmember Beaton. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to talk about and at any opportunity to talk about our transit system. Um, it's something that I have I think about a lot and um, have really thought about and talked about since before I was elected for the first time and um, and continue to hear about how we can strengthen it to better serve our community. Um, I hear a lot of people talking about how to increase ridership um, as a way to um, improve our uh, connection to each other and to our services around the city as well as reducing our fossil fuel um, emissions and um, reducing you know traffic and parking congestion and and so I think that um, this plan as along with all of the other sort of um, plans that we have uh, related to our transit uh, system is an opportunity to um, learn from and consider how we can make it better to improve um, transit usage. Um, I, uh, I, I just wanted to kind of bring to, to light that, um, you know, our university students use our transit system in such an incredible way. Um, I remember as a, uh, as a student not so many years ago, um, using our transit system 
like as that choice rider that we're always talking about. Um, I remember choosing to ride the bus because it was free um, rather than driving my car halfway on a really you know cold day or, or rainy day rather than walking. And so um, I think that um, the this contract that we have here with the city or with the, the university that provides free transit service to students is a really good model for what we could look at um, in other parts of our system. Um, you know, I've kind of looking through these numbers, I did the math and um, students make up for about 41% 40, of our ridership, um, but they pay about 19% about of our cost. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, I think that's a wonderful thing. And I think that it really shows that investing in, in really smart ways can increase, um, we can pay less and increase the amount of riders that we have on, in our system. I look to systems like Missoula, Montana. I had the opportunity to speak to their mayor about their free transit, transit service, and um, they were able to double their ridership in like two years because of uh, their fare free system. And so um, all that to say, I'm really excited that this service is gonna continue and hope that we can um, continue to look for ways to improve our system as a whole. Thank you, Councilmember Beaton. Um, Further comments or amendments? Council Member Anderson. Uh, thank you, Acting President Worthman. Just a, a, a couple of quick comments. Um, one thing is that we heard from folks last night that they were concerned with parking in the third ward neighborhood. And I just wanted to point out that this is an example of something that our city is doing to alleviate that issue and to promote um, public, you know, public transit and um, reduce the, the parking strains that we have. Um, the other thing is, on a personal note, I, I went to school in a city that had a cooperative agreement between the university and um, the city for public transit and those negotiations failed um, right before the school year and it created a huge hardship for um, for myself and for other students and so I just wanted to point out um, that the the positive relationship and the hard work from people from the city and the university really does impact people's lives and so I'm just really um, pleased to see this agreement thank you thank you council member Further comments? Councilmember Greger. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I do also want to thank staff for their their work on this and the students and administrators that, that put their time in to, to really put together a great agreement. Um, I do kind of want to reiterate that how important this, this partnership is really for the neighborhoods around the university. And I do think, um, you know, there, there's a, a lot of parking congestion, obviously, around the campus and traffic congestion that, that this helps alleviate. Um, I do think that there's certainly um, some opportunities, uh, particularly in the evening service category, where there's only once an hour service, um, where I think I've heard from students that they will, that they decide not to ride the bus because they need to get to something in the evening, like a job, or, or it's dark when they're walking home, and um, they would prefer to have evening service. So. So I'm kind of open to, you know, various changes certainly, and right now that's in, in the strong hands of our staff to to help decide and, um, and and negotiate. I but I do think there could be a role at some point in the future for transit commission or, or the city council to be involved in in helping, um, to set some parameters for those negotiations that could really, um, you know, maybe meet some additional needs within the partnership. Uh, however, I do think this was, um, you know, it's a great contract. I, I think it, another thing I'll point out that has changed since the last contract or around the time that we last had a contract negotiation is that uh, we've added a, a student to our transit commission. Mm -hmm. And serving on our transit commission, I find that extremely valuable to have a student um, there at all the meetings and, and someone, you know, I, who I was able to, to call two days ago to, to make sure, like, Everything was set for this contract from their perspective and, and kind of building that relationship with students and um, directly within our governance and just wanted to show appreciation for that foresight that our previous city councils have had to add that position. So mm -hmm. just wanted to speak in general in favor of this, but also to a few points where I think we could um, keep, we can keep pushing ourselves. So Thank you. <coughs> Council Member Emanuel. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, I would like to um, echo what my colleagues shared and thank you to Mr. Pippinger and 
your entire team, Mr. Wagner, for just your detailed presentation. The logic is incredible, and it's easy to support this um, this agreement. Um, you've laid out a really thoughtful case um, to the penny, and um, I just thank you for that um, attention to detail. I would like to make an amendment, and I'll speak to the amend or I'll speak the amendment and then speak to it if I have a seconder. Sure. So I'd add on number 19 that would state modifications or waivers to this agreement shall be brought before the city council for final city approval. And I can read that again if that's helpful. Sure, if you could read it again. Yep, modifications or waivers to this agreement shall be brought before the city council for final city approval. Okay, um, is there um, anyone in council who wishes to be a second on that? Council Member Beaton? I'll turn, turn it back over to you, Council Member Emanuel. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, I don't know if there's interest or support, so this is a way I gauge it, is by putting it on the floor. Um, I have to say that I was contacted by a handful of students during the negotiation process who were pretty frustrated with how things were going, and I didn't even know that the city was negotiating a contract, and so I did reach out um, to the manager, and he shared that, yes, and negotiations, negotiations were underway. Um, however, there wasn't really a mechanism to, um, I feel like, um, engage in that unless it was here at the end, which, you know, as Council Member Gregor shared that it did work out, you know, fine, and they're supportive, and that's good. And so I do get concerned that because of the dynamic changes of a student body that changes potentially every year that there may not be that pathway to the elected representatives when we have over 10,000 people who live in our city who can utilize the service of the bus. I think it's a good mechanism just to build in that communication tool. You know, So we would put all the good faith and um, hopes that any future discussion would go as well as it did here, where we, it yields a very good final re result. And in the case it doesn't, then there's kind of a stopgap there for the citizen students to um, make their case one last time and ultimately let that decision lay with the body. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilor Emanuel. Are there, uh, actually I'll ask Councilor Beaton, would you like to add as a second or do you want to add to that? Okay. Are there other members who would like to speak on this amendment as proposed? Council Member Gregor. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I, I do appreciate the, the, um, the thoughtfulness of this. I think it's something I could potentially support. I, um, I do kind of wonder what the role of Transit Commission may be in something like this um, as well um, in terms of reviewing, but obviously this is something that is ultimately something that is in the power of the city council. Um, I guess just something to think about in terms of whether the contract should even go in front of transit commission first before it goes in front of council, but that's currently not the case, nor is transit commission uh, necessarily made aware that a contract is about to be up for renewal and negotiation either. Um, but yeah, just kind of thinking out loud a little bit um, as we as we consider this. Thank you. Um, further comments on the amendment? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Christofferson? No. Emmanuel? Aye. Gregert? Aye. Strobel? No. Weld? No. Worthman? Aye. John? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. Fergie? Aye. That amendment passed on a six to three vote. My apologies, seven to three. Further comments on the contract this evening? Further amendments? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Emanuel? Aye. Gregert? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Weld? Aye. Worthman? Aye. John? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. Fergie? Aye. Christofferson? Aye. And that agreement passed.
thank you for all of the work that went into it as well. Um, we move then to item number 19 on our agenda this evening. This is a resolution that would authorize Community Services Department to accept a $1,000 donation from the Chippewa Valley Transit Alliance for free transit rides on Earth Day and for marketing that event. Because this amendment would change our budget, it's going to require a two-thirds vote of the elected <coughs> members or eight affirmative votes for adoption. Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Acting President Whitman and Council Members. Um, so I'm very happy to bring this before you. Um, the Transit Commission uh, was ready to uh, provide free rides out of the um, transit marketing budget. Um, they had given that um, signal to me that that was something that they were being in favor of, and so it would be all would have been handled within the scope of our budget. And uh, the Chippewa Valley Transit Alliance came forward with this uh, generous donation. So uh, typically. Uh, a, we collect between $500 and $600 a day uh, for fares, so that's what we're looking at that cost. And then the additional amount then would be go towards um, the promotion of, of uh, the free rides for that day. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Uh, questions from Council on this item? Any call, clarifying questions? I see none. Thank you again. Council Member Beaton. Thank you. Um, this is something that I've um, been talking to Beaver Creek about, and so I was kind of hearing about some details kind of through the vines, and I just want to make sure, um, it seemed uh, quite a while ago there was some talk about like um, some vouchers versus just like a full free day. Um, I just want to confirm that, that, that it, it, it'll be free for everybody who gets on the bus on Earth Day. That's correct. Okay. We're the it's we're going to close up the fare boxes. No okay. fares will be collected at all, so okay. anyone can ride. Thank you. Any further questions? Appreciate it again, Mr. Wagner. Then on a motion, we're back around um, from Council Member Strobel and seconded by Council Member Anderson. This um, donation item has been moved. Are there any questions? Council Member, sorry, uh, comments. Council Member Beaton. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is a really exciting thing to happen. Um, Earth Day is one of my favorite days. All my friends text me and ha wish me a happy Earth Day. Um, and I think it's a really awesome way for our city to celebrate Earth Day um, and a, a great way to kind of um, raise the attention and likability of the program, the, the transit program. So um, I really appreciate the work that the transit manager has done and the transit commission um, and outside groups like the um, Chippewa Valley Transit, transit Alliance. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, do we have any further comments? Council Member Gregor. Uh, thank you, Acting President Worthman. I just wanted to, to note that I'll be abstaining from this vote because of my service on the board of directors of the Chippewa Valley Transit Alliance. Okay. Do we note it? Any further comments? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Strobel? Aye. Well? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Jean? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. Berge? Aye. Christopherson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. And that item passes. We move to item 20 on our agenda this evening regarding parks, open space, and recreation facilities plan. This is a resolution amending the 2018 to 2022 Park Open Space and Recreation Facilities Plan to classify 111 Niagara Street as a special park and open space area. If you'll recall, we had discussion last night um, and our hearing last night on this uh, item. Do any council members have questions for Mr. Pippinger or other staff regarding um, this special designation? Council Member Christofferson. Thank you, um, Acting President Worthman. <clears throat> Apparently, I have this cost issue on my brain today. I don't know where that's coming from. But when uh, neighborhoods talk about their neighborhood uh, spaces and parks, there's always the idea about the cost of maintenance. And I remember specifically that in the presentation that, that the only thing that we had done with this park earlier was very occasional mowing. So I'm just wondering, where does the, how is this going to change our relationship as, as maintenance or 
a budgeted cost for the parks department, That's a good question. which operates with extreme efficiency. Great question. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Pedro. Um, yes, we would be looking at increasing our maintenance of this area. Uh, we do maintain the uh, community park across the street at Owen Park at a higher level, so oh. we would be looking at about the same uh, level to make sure that it's mowed down and uh, kept into a, a higher level of maintenance. And then just for follow-up? Sure. So it is really that the obligation that came with the plan, they're going to take care of everything and we'll just be mowing? Yep, uh, and we're working on that memorandum of understanding right now with the, uh, with the Randall Park Neighborhood uh, right. Association and that will be coming uh, before you uh, sometime in the near future. Any other questions on this item? Thank you, Mr. Pevinger. Then on a motion by Council Member Emanuel, seconded by Council Member Weld, item number 20 has been moved and is open for discussion. Anyone like to speak first? Council Member Emanuel. I'd like to thank the neighborhood, which happens to be in the same one I live in. Uh, we do live in um, a, a neighborhood that's called Distressed. We um, are a neighborhood that has struggled and has amazing opportunities. And so what I think uh, we see before us is a group of citizens who came together with a really great idea to help build some um, civic connections and social connections in the neighborhood. Um, in the last couple of years, the university has helped to sponsor neighborhood picnics and city manager and many of um, our city staff have been involved, including police and fire department. Um, to bring people together to play games and what a better thing to have something that's permanent where people can come together. And this is very good for, for people and connections. Thank you for that. Further comments on this proposed amendment? <coughs> Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Well? Aye. Worthman? Aye. John? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. Bergie? Aye. Christofferson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Gregert? Aye. Strobel? Aye. And that item passes. We move to item 21 on our agenda this evening. This is regarding the steam locomotive 2719. This resolution uh, is re in regards to the disposition of the Sioux line steam locomotive and will be presented by council members Strobel and Gregert. Would you both wish to come up to the, the front here to present, or would you like to present from your seat? Okay. I'll lead off with you, Councilmember Strobel. Actually, I was sort of thinking we would just move the resolution and then speak to it. Okay. I don't really have a presentation. That works. Um, so then we'll on a motion by Councilmember Strobel and Councilmember Gragert, move and second this item, and I'll open it back up to you. Uh, okay, and actually, by popular demand. <laughs> and not quite how I not quite how I envisioned it, but hey. <laughs> Sorry. Here's one here's my train file. <laughs> um, I, I just first of all I want to thank Councilmember Gregor for being my second on this and on the uh, the initial resolution um, uh, last year that allowed uh, uh, council to regain uh, ownership of the 2719. Also, past councils that, that allowed me to get a stipulation put in there that we would have that ability um, in a few years. Um, I also want to thank this council for supporting the resolution, uh, allowing us to do some time for uh, research on this. Um, my thanks to staff for helping us with potential static sites, uh, reaching out to some of our potential options for leasing and moving. Um, I want to thank Bill Anderson for drawing a potential shelter, Jack Kaiser for helping us secure temporary indoor storage at Banbury Place, and to visit Eau Claire for setting up the community forum um, and offering to fundraise for the final move and shelter construction, as well as pushing me to bring this forward to council. Um, we listed a bunch of options that we needed to flush out when this was brought to council last year. Um, we have had uh, time to get better information now and I'll try to explain why we are bringing this resolution and how we got here. Um, we had the indoor storage set up, shelter design, several potential sites, 
and uh, um, an original moving estimate as well, um, and a hundred thousand dollar budget to get the train back to Eau Claire. Um, we put out RFPs for moving quotes, um, but we found that railroad and museum community are, are a pretty tight knit group. Um, the number of companies that actually move trains is very limited. Um, uh, we're a, really a one-time move, and uh, museums offer steady work. So we only got a couple of uh, quotes, and actually they were more like estimates and not quotes. So those numbers were never firm, actually. Um, they were much higher than our original estimates that we brought to council initially back in July. Um, Were they hired to discourage us or because uh, it was a city seeking to do the move? Um, I don't know, but the logistics and the costs were pretty prohibitive. Um, some of the extra costs were for larger cranes that we needed to lift the, the train off at Banbury Place. They have a retaining wall there, so smaller cranes could not get close enough. Um, that added cost. Um, that's if we moved it on a flatbed railroad car. Um, we also looked at disassembling it and trucking it here. But of course that added labor to disassemble and reassemble and it also made it not feasible. Um, we, then we looked at the dead end towing option where they actually pull the train here with another train. Uh, two movers told us that with new railroad regulations that was not even possible anymore. So we tried another option. We reached out to Altoona to see if they would like to partner with us on the move back. Uh, as River Prairie seemed like a, a very logical and perfect place for a static display. Um, um, they discussed it, they looked at the sites, the costs, uh, ultimately they decided it wouldn't work for them. So given that a second move to a permanent shelter would also be very expensive, um, it's actually a lot more feasible to just fundraise and move the train one time and we are not ready for that. Um, Throughout this process, we heard from uh, many who would love to see the train still run. Uh, we did not want to get it here, have it in storage without a firm plan to get a permanent site and shelter, while also seeking to keep it in good condition so that it might run someday. We do feel our best options at this time is retain the ownership, but yet to see if we can't work out a lease that requires it to run again, also gives future citizens and councils the ability and the time to figure out a plan to return the train in the future. We think our resolution will serve to give city staff direction to lease out the train. Duluth had indicated to us in a letter they sent to the city dated 725 of 2018 that they would be interested in leasing should we reconsider moving it. If it does not work out with them, then the direction is to put out a nationwide RFP to see if others might be interested in leasing it. Um, and the last option, would be to seek out buyers nationwide. We have had contact from two different communities already without even advertising for it um, because our, our mission was to actually move it back here, but we have had contact with other communities that were potentially interested in, in uh, the train. Um, so the thought behind the conditions came from a gentleman on the Western Wisconsin Rail Coalition um, who has contacts in Duluth. Um, we require it to be running again in a couple of years, allow a lease to cover at least the length of time it is certified for. Um, and he also suggested how neat it would be if at the end of its uh, usable life up there that the last mission might be steaming it down to Eau Claire. Um, it's easier certainly and cheaper to move a train under its own power and uh, that seemed like a pretty, pretty neat idea. Um, the Duluth Museum does not need any more static displays. Um, so I think we should make every effort to return the train here or find a different option for it uh, when its running days are over. And we were repeatedly told in meetings and via email how the train could be running fairly soon. Um, I think if the 2719 is gonna be kept outside under an overpass, like it has been since 2013, with no plan to run it, um, then I think the city should reconsider what's best for the train and the city and I think this, allow, this resolution allows to have those conversations. Um, we don't know what the future will hold, um, but if Eau Claire gets passenger rail again, uh, we may have more opportunities. Uh, the people in the organizations might be in place to accomplish our dream of returning the 2719 to Eau Claire. That's all I have.
Thank you, Council Member Strobel. Council Member Gregor, would you like to add to that? Uh, maybe not with my own whistle. I, I, could, <laughs> I could attempt, but no. um, yeah, I wanted to, to thank uh, Council Member Strobel um, for really his leadership on this. Um, it's kind of all been about options for me and just and making sure um, the, the passion that exists on this council could be could uh, have a have a way of of getting some work done and and reaching out and figuring out what, what those options truly are and I I think we certainly have explored um, a lot of different options and now we're at a point where essentially we're opening up a bigger conversation about uh, the future of the locomotive in in potentially the hands of the Lake Superior Railroad Museum or potentially in other hands. Uh, but I think, you know, the things that we heard from the public too, I think were really important along this, this process. And uh, obviously there's, there's folks that put a lot of time and money into this locomotive when it was in Eau Claire and, and, and found a, a home for it in Duluth. Um, so I think, you know, certainly I've gained an appreciation for that, that work. And, um, and, and for this locomotive as, a, as something we need to preserve and, and have responsibility for. And I think that, that includes, and that means taking ownership of it and, um, and so that we can control that future uh, and, and potentially bring it back to Eau Claire. I do think another thing I heard from the public throughout this process was that there's a strong interest in having it run again and having it um, really in its full glory, I guess you could say, as a as a working steam locomotive, um, and um, I think this resolution can open up the conversation for that to happen again, even if it's not going to happen at all, Claire, because we don't have the financial resources, or we don't have um, necessarily the volunteers, or maybe we don't have um, track that is suitable, or maybe we don't have a location quite as scenic as the as the Lake Shore of Lake Superior. Um, but I think that um, ultimately it, it led to like having a fiscal eye on this that I think was really <laughs> important that hopefully um, a relationship that we build with, with a new um, partner or maybe the, the partner we have in, in Duluth right now um, could be very responsible from a fiscal standpoint for the citizens of Eau Claire as well while we maintain ownership. So. Um, that's just kind of my way of s summarizing my, my thoughts at this moment and um, do also have a minor amendment to make as well um, that kind of um, adds some clarity to a historic a piece of information, I guess. Um, and that is um, uh, the whereas clause the second one in the resolution currently reads, um, in 1994, uh, the 2719 was the first train added to the National Register of Historic Places. Um, in fact, it was the, the first uh, locomotive in Wisconsin to be added to that National Register of Historic Places. So I wanted to, to correct that line by replacing the word, um, also to clarify it by uh, replacing the word train with locomotive and then adding the words in Wisconsin after that as the amendment. Um, Councilmember Strobel finds that a uh, friendly amendment. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Gregor, for your comments and your amendment. Do other council members have comments? We've already moved and seconded this item, so it's open for further amendments or any other comments before we vote. Council Member Berge. Question for Council Member Strowell. Um, you said two other communities were interested. Was that in, interested in leasing or buying or just? I would not be able to clarify for sure if it was buying or leasing. Um, I know they had inquired about, about the train. So okay. I, I didn't speak to them personally, but I, okay. I know they did inquire. So I'm not sure. OK, just curious. Council Member John. Thank you. Uh, I, I heard you mentioned something about finance seems a bit uh, challenging. 
has it to be any, how much does this kind of bring that, that thing back, and how much does it cost to uh, financing to take that back to up there? Council Member Strobel? So the question was how much would it cost to bring it here? The, yes. The estimate, the low estimate was uh, 185, I believe. Pardon me? The low estimate was 185,000, and it was a very stressed that it was just an estimate, and you know that could have gone potentially much higher, could have been lower, I guess. But um, you know, it, it just seemed like there was a lot of logistics problems, and it, and it could have certainly gone much higher. Can I ask a second question? So, with the 185,000 dollars. That money be come from different organizations, fundings, or fundraising, or any like city money. How that? How that? How that? So, if I'm clear on the question, is where would we get that amount? Correct. Um, well, we we had a uh, we had a hundred thousand dollar budgeted from the CIP here, and uh, the initial thought was to fundraise for it, but um, the. Uh, the primary fund fundraising group we had was um, thought they would be more interested in fundraising the final move. So from from our location, Banbury Place, to uh, a new shelter. So they were interested in fundraising for the the final move and the uh, shelter, and that would have probably been north of uh, six figures as well. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Manuel. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, my question is in regards to the CIP um, amendment that Council passed unanimously that moved $100,000 to the CIP, um, reprioritizing a couple of other things in the budget, um, specifically the O'Brien Rink support beam painting and the design and installation of the lily pad walk at Fairfax Pool to the tune of $100,000. I was in support of it, um, so I'm not questioning that. My question would be, though, if what happens now with that allocation that's been essentially identified for the move that likely is not going to happen? City Manager Peters. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. So essentially that money would be unspent. I mean, so we would not be moving forward with that program. Um, and to the extent that we're just starting the CIP process, um, you know, those, those needs that were identified before are still out there um, and would be reevaluated when we prioritize what we'd be bringing forward to you in the, I guess it'd be the 2020 through 25 uh, CIP. Council Member? Thank you, Acting President Worthman. So unless Council were to take specific action around the $100,000, then that money would go then to fund balance, which in a way pays down our CIP? I would ask um, uh, Mr. Winzens to help out if I don't answer this correctly, but um, the, you know, to the extent that much of the CIP is borrowed money, it would just simply mean that we wouldn't be borrowing the money. Um, so to the extent that we do the projects and as we need the money to fund the CIP that has the allocations and we borrow, so if we don't have that project, we wouldn't be borrowing that money. So it's not really a return to fund balance per se as much as you know, we wouldn't be borrowing it. To the extent that it was money that would have been used um, from the fund balance transfer, then it's just less money that's used and it would remain in the, in the fund balance. Hang on a second. I think there's going to be a little further augmentation to that. You are exactly right, except that. Except that. <laughs> <laughs> except that uh, uh, Mr. Pippinger reminded me that uh, uh, we used community enhancement funds um, mm -hmm. to fund uh, the 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 train the train move. So everything uh, the city manager said is is true. Is true. Uh, these funds would remain within the community enhancement fund, and then we would um, reallocate the those funds as part of. Um, the upcoming uh, CIP process. So basically, it, mean, it would mean that we have $100,000 more in community enhancement funds to use for um, other community enhancement type projects. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further questions, comments? Council Marie Manuel. Thank you, Acting President Orthman. Um, 
I'm not sure who this question's for. It might be to Councilmember Shorbel or to Councilmember Gregor. Um, I guess, is there ever a point where, like just for being tidy about the transaction of what to do with the train, is there ever a point, maybe not in your heart, Mr. Strobel, but is there ever a point where the city says, we're done entertaining, trying to figure out a home for this and we're just gonna let things be? Like, what does that look like? Council Member Strobel? Certainly, I'm not going to be here to be part of that decision, but how I would see it um, is I, I actually think this resolution um, answers that. Um, because if, if the leases can be worked out, we retain ownership and, and it, uh, everybody's happy and, and potentially down the road, a, a future council would make a decision if they want to release the train or if that train is done with its movable, if it's life. Um, if we can't work out a lease with someone, then, then the direction is to potentially put it out for sale. I mean, put, but, but at the time, just look at maybe more markets than where it's at. So I think in fairness to the city and the taxpayers, you should put it out nationwide. And, and see if there are, you know, I guess what you could get for it. So I guess that there is, there is that thought. So I think everybody, we had a lot of feedback that people wanted to get the train back to a clear. We also had a lot of feedback that people wanted to see it running. So, you know, sort of a, uh, a win-win would be to keep the ownership with that ability to bring it home and then potentially keep it someplace where it could run. If that can't work, then the direction is in there. And staff would have to bring this all back to your, the next council as well. Um, any, any type of agreement staff would have to bring back. So you can you can always give a different direction, but that's how I would see it. May I ask that a follow-up? Yeah, Councilman Marie Manuel. Thank you, Acting President Orthman. So, I mean, I I'm totally speaking hypothetically. I have spent zero time working on the train, so I don't have any inside train scoop here. Hypothetically, the current location where it's at, they could say we'd like to buy the train for a dollar and make this our forever home. There's a lot of ifs that would take place and you're raising your eyebrow at me, that's fine. Hypothetically though, I mean, that could end this transaction to say, okay, well, that's the answer then. Or maybe it's a million dollars and then funds go to the Strobel Foundation or something like that. That sounds better. But hypothetically, somebody could come in and say, we'd like to pay for this train and, and then that's it in its new home. It's not in my hypotheticals, but it, it, you know, uh, they, any of those transactions could probably occur. But I think the direction here is to attempt to lease it out, attempt to keep ownership. Um, and if they wanted to buy it for a dollar, then I would say the direction is in there to put an RFP out to nationwide so that the city of Eau Claire can make sure they maximize the revenue they would get from a train, which is actually a very valuable asset. Not, a, not only, um, you know, historically, but it's, it's a valuable asset. Um, and so I, I think, in fairness to your citizens, you'd want to uh, see if there were other interested parties at that time. So. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments on this resolution? I see none. Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Worthman? Aye. John? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. Fergie? Aye. Christopherson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Gregert? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Weld? Aye. That passes unanimously. We will move to our ordinances for action this evening. First up, item number 22. This ordinance would rezone property located on the west side of First Avenue between Chippewa Street and Niagara Street from RM to P. This is in file Z1641-19. We had a presentation last evening on this rezoning. Uh, do council members have questions for either Mr. Scott Allen or, or any other staff? Clarifications? See none. Then on a motion by, I believe we're back around to no, council member Emmanuel, seconded by council member Weld. This rezoning uh, has been moved. Is there any comment? Comment? I see none. Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member John? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. Berge? Aye. Christofferson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Gregert? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Weld? Aye. Worthman? Aye. <coughs> that passes. We move to item 23. This is an ordinance rezoning property located at 103 
117 and 123 Roosevelt app from R1 to P public and to approve the site plan for a visitor center and admissions building with the site improvement. This is in file Z164219. Uh, Mr. Scott Allen is going to talk to us shortly about um, a further condition that is being recommended um, to be added to the uh, to the list of uh, recommendations. Mr. Scott Allen. All right. Thank you, Acting President Worthman and members of the council. Uh, at your seats uh, this afternoon was uh, placed a, a brief memo and then the draft uh, essentially a letter of conditions that are noted in typical fashion to the applicant uh, following approval uh, by the City Council. Uh, there were seven initial conditions. Uh, staff is requesting and recommending that an eighth be added, uh, simply referencing that westernmost crosswalk that was uh, presented by uh, Mr. Ivory uh, last night and further discussed by the applicant and the representative, Ms. Goodwin, from Ayers Associates. Again, the condition reads, a submittal of revised plans for the realigned west crosswalk for engineering department approval. So that's uh, additional condition that staff would uh, recommend uh, including in that letter for your consideration as a part of uh, the ordinance uh, discussion consideration tonight. Okay. Do council members have any questions of Mr. Allen regarding the addition of that condition? Sure. Uh, City Manager Peters. Mr. Allen, could you uh, um, perhaps just outline if, uh, if the university is aware of that condition and if they agree to it? I think both Mr. Ivory and uh, Mr. Rindo are here. They're certainly welcome to, to share. But I, I believe, again, this was uh, based upon a uh, a re requested uh, change from the applicant. So they were the ones to present this uh, modification and staff is simply asking for revised plans that would better show uh, the kind of last minute change and that crosswalk realignment. And I'll defer to uh, the applicant, uh, Mr. Rindo, for further clarification. Thank you, I just made aware of it, so. Uh, pre appreciate uh, Mr. Ivory sharing it. Uh, this was a this was something that we requested based on feedback that we received from Plan Commission on safety concerns for that crosswalk, and uh, and so uh, we we accept that as a condition, and we'll be pleased to work with the engineering department. Thank you. Uh, do council members have questions? I think Councilman McGregor does. Uh, thank you, Acting President Worthman. Thank you, Mr. Rindo. Um, I guess you know one of the um, one of the aspects of the the new condition is um, a rapid rectangular flashing beacon. And my understanding is there's a relatively significant cost for that. So I just wanted to make sure you, or maybe the staff would be able to provide um, an estimate on the cost. But um, just wanted to make sure you're, you're aware and or ask if you are aware of the cost. Uh, not aware specifically of the cost, no. You want to ask a follow-up? Yeah, perhaps could staff provide an estimate on the cost of, of installing and purchasing a, a beacon of that nature? Eight, I'm getting eight. Eight, I'm sure if that is. I'm trying to get a crowd up there. The, uh, eight dollars? <laughs> the ones we put in on Farwell Street and, and Hardy Evansville were, were between eight and ten thousand dollars. Do you have further uh, questions? Yes, the so question would be whether you feel comfortable with that dollar amount. <laughs> well, I, I think that you know our, our most important concern there is it's a busy intersection. Um, it, there's a lot of traffic that goes in and out of campus uh, to the Phillips and Davies lot. Uh, it's going to be a primary point of entrance for prospective students and families, and so safety is a paramount concern for us, and, and we think that's a good solution to be able to um, proceed with those kinds of safety requirements. Thank you. I think that's all of our questions. Thank you, Mr. Rindo. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, we will move this item then 
as amended, the letter that's been amended um, by council member it would be beaten, seconded by council member Zhang. The floor is open. Council member McGregor. Thank you, I did want to acknowledge the, you know, the interest of the applicant in, um, in, in, in finding a, an avenue to, to enhance the crosswalk and um, that, that I personally had a, a concern about um, in this original design on the western end of the um, of this project, the Welcome Center, um, the the western crosswalk re le reaching the campus. Um, certainly, I think what is being proposed is is better, um, and certainly I expect that that staff will work out those details um, to make it as as safe as possible. So, just wanted to show my appreciation for the for the attention to that, that topic that, that was brought up at Planning Commission. Um, and also just to speak in favor of the project, um, I think, um, you know, obviously the neighborhood had, had early concerns about other possible uh, uses of that land. And, and we're really talking about that zoning today and the site plan, but um, this is, I think, a very good use of the land. I think the design is, is good and I appreciate the partnership with the Student Office of Sustainability to make sure that that sensitive location on, on Putnam Park and on Little Niagara can be um, respected as part of the project as well um, and carry out some environmental improvements. Um, I do think that that LEED certification would have been uh, it sounds like it's still a potential with that project, and that's a, that's an exciting thing to me too, um, because I think that brings along with it all sorts of considerations, and I obviously some of those had have occurred already, um, but I guess yeah, I just wanted to show my support for it. Thank you, Council Member. Is there further comments uh, or amendments on this item? It would be Council Member Christopherson. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, I just want to make this comment based on the um, large number of Third Ward citizens that were here last night testifying to their interest in protection of the quality of their neighborhood. And uh, this is a, a beautiful construction for a, a cause that I, I think this admission, uh, visitation, structure, at an entry to the campus is going to be very effective. But I think we all want to be aware that this is also um, at, a, at a point where the university literally meets the residential neighborhood. And uh, people were concerned about um, would the traffic on Roosevelt actually increase? And of course, they're, we're thinking no, but I, that's really the response of the university to direct that parking to a different area so that people are walking on the campus. And then the, the idea that there would be um, some kind of barrier nurtured between this building and the nearest neighbor. So I, I just want to lift up the voices that we heard talking about you know, we're, we're trying to preserve and protect a residential neighborhood that is right next to a, a vibrant and growing and dynamic institution of a university. So. Um, I think this is a beautiful construction, and I hope that we continue to partner well with that neighborhood. Thank you, Council Member. Further comments, any amendments before we take a vote? I think we're ready to go. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. Bergie? Aye. Christofferson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Braggart? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Well? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Jean. And that item passes. We move to item 24 on our agenda this evening. This is also regarding zoning, specifically rezoning property located at 1106 Mondovi Road from C3H to C3P. This, the details of this can be found in zoning file Z164319. We had a presentation last evening from Mr. Scott Allen, but are there any questions or follow-up clarifications that council might have on this. Council Member Christofferson. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I, I continue to struggle with the timing on, on this. And um, 
in the presentation, there was conversation about this broader regional look at um, the setbacks, mm -hmm. and then the uh, consumer's urgency about it having to be, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's anything that would help me get a perspective on the, the importance of those different pieces. Could you maybe clarify your question? Um, is it, and is it for Mr. Scott Allen? I think so. Okay. Could you just clarify your, your question in terms of, um, are you thinking maybe it's a good idea I'm, to I'm, wait until? I'm wondering if the city, as far as our workload or the participation that we have, be, are, do we see some urgency that this uh, zoning, can, the setback zoning can be changed? Should be changed? In reference to the overall uh, Claremont Avenue corridor, staff is doing research right now, and we actually did research in advance of the Plan Commission meeting in early March mm -hmm. to have a discussion with Plan Commission members. And at that time, there was a very clear uh, consensus on what, you know, uh, what specific number, if we're going to pick a number, would be best for this area or the corridor in general. So we did get enough feedback, though, to look at some general uh, ranges for modifying uh, various um, you know, intersections, areas along Claremont. Uh, some are older than others, of course. Uh, some are getting redeveloped. Uh, some are a little more static. So that's what we're, we're kind of wrestling with right now is to see how fine-grained we want to make revisions to the overall corridor. But certainly, we don't want to recommend or take any direction on a very piecemeal uh, property by property approach. If that helps answer your question. May I ask a clarifying? Sure. Uh, so does this request actually fall within the knowledge that you're accumulating? Is this, this request that appears to be piecemeal, is it going to fit into the findings that Will we, will we find ourselves yes. needing to be in line with this decision, or is this decision in line with what you're going to recommend? Correct, the latter. But this is uh, very, um, very specific in nature, specific again to the proposed outdoor seating area, and only at a 60-foot setback, whereas, again, currently per code, it's 70 in that whole area. So uh, from the feedback we already gotten from Plan Commission, uh, 60 was certainly not even a discussion item. It was certainly something less than that. So this is still within that, I guess, headroom where there's some uh, flexibility. So having this one request, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it could be seen as piecemeal in a way in that we're addressing the one request to move forward with the requested outdoor seating area but we're not addressing perhaps the uh, new pole sign or the pylon 20, sign. The 20 foot. Right, so correct. It's so it's, it's taking one step uh, to assist the, the property owner with their expansion plans, yet still be within that uh, reasonable area where it wouldn't impact the overall mm -hmm. uh, research and modifications that we may recommend for the whole corridor. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you for the question, Councilman Christopherson. Any further questions on this item? I see none. Right, thank you thank again. You. Then on a motion, I believe we're around to Council Member Gragger, seconded by Council Member Berge. Seems good enough. <laughs> this item has been moved. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Beaton? Aye. Berge? Aye. Christofferson? Aye. Amen. Gregert? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Well? Aye. Worthman? Aye. John? Aye. Anderson? Aye. That ordinance passes. We move then to our ordinances for introduction this evening. We just have one ordinance for introduction, item number 25, which would rezone property located on the north side of Seymour Road, east of Andover Ave from TR1A to T, my apologies, to R1. This is in zoning file Z164419. Is there a wish by council to suspend the rules and take up this item separately? Any wish to suspend the rules? I see no desire. We will then move to our announcements by the city manager and city council. Thank you, 
Thanking President Ruthman. Um, next Tuesday is your organizational meeting. So uh, we will uh, get together, which starts at 4 o'clock. Uh, we're going to try a picture outside, um, assuming the snow has melted and gone away and we don't have the, the weather forecast that we're looking at for this week. But what we'd like to do is have you all meet on the west end of the Grand Avenue Bridge, so right down on the other side of the building uh, at 4 o'clock. We'll try for a group picture. If it looks like the weather's not going to cooperate with that, we'll send you an email and, um, and have an in, in their uh, place. Uh, we've also uh, made some arrangements for portraits. Uh, last year we lost our photographer for, for portraits. Um, and so if you'd like to submit your own picture for a portrait or if you'd like to go to Sharp One, for, uh, Sharp One Hour Photo, you can sit for a portrait and, um, and we'll take care of that. So, um, and you can do that at any time, but just know that, that that's out there. But So 4 o'clock next Wednesday, West End of the Grand Native Move Bridge, uh, we'll, we'll try for an outdoor picture, and if that doesn't work, we'll, we'll move it uh, inside. Um, Kathy uh, Marole has a packet for you, so don't leave tonight um, until you pick up that packet. It's got all the information for you uh, related to the boards and the commissions and the other work that will take place uh, with the, uh, the organizational meeting. So that's Tuesday of next week. On Wednesday then is the chamber dinner, the annual uh, dinner, although I guess it's not quite a dinner this year. They're, they're, they're changing up their format a little bit and, and trying to uh, make it a little less than a sit down dinner. But if you have not signed up for that, um, don't know if there's a whole lot of space left, but uh, let Kathy know and uh, we'll see if we can get you in on that. Um, and then on Thursday, the 25th in the afternoon will be uh, the first part of our uh, council uh, training academy. Uh, and hopefully you are all able to, uh, to make that. Um, and certainly the new members of the city council are able to, uh, to make that. Um, and then the second half of that will be on May 2nd um, in the morning from 8 to 12. In between there on the uh, Friday the 26th is an eggs and issues. So plenty of activities and opportunities for you uh, coming forward. I guess then uh, the final announcement I would have is just uh, for Council Member Zhang and Strobel. Uh, thank you very much for your service to the council and service to the community. And uh, Acting President Worthman, thank you very much for your service. Um, I've uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to get to know you and work together in a different capacity. So thank you for that. So those are the announcements that I would have. Thank you, City Manager Peters. Uh, I'd like to recognize um, Council Member Zhang. A few words. Did yeah, you want to say a few words? I'd like to say a few words. Um, Six years with the council, as it flying by very fast. Um, I want to thank uh, city manager, city staff, and I know most of you, but this is going pretty fast, and I don't know everybody, but I, I do appreciate everything. It makes so easy to us, so flexibility, and everything here is a presence very well. Um, uh, I know that I have not a job, I do not have much time here, but I, I love what the city have done and what they have bring to the community and um, thank you for all your hard work and what you have done. Um, uh, recently I just talked to someone from Chicago and she said, well, Michael, I'm glad that you and the city council member, you guys have done a good job without all the pothole and all the stuff and all clear, that's really making me happy. And yeah, we, we did. We actually um, worked so hard and everything's going well. So it's, it's kind of nice to hear that from people who are from different state or different city. But again, uh, thank you so much for keeping our place safe and thank you so much for uh, working with city councils um, for all this uh, challenge and here until the next many years. Um, I also want to thank you for thank you all the citizens in our player who vote for me for the last two years. I know you have, it means um, um, giving me some trust, but I you know I do what I can, and I know that we have new councils coming. I'm sure they'll do wonderful jobs as well. Um, my fellow city council, thank you so much. I know we all have a lot of difference, but at the end we all work together and put out a lot of difference outside and. and put out this idea together and work together to make a clear better place. Yeah. I will miss you all. I will think about you guys Monday and, and, and Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Long hours, but appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, hoping to meet you around in Eau Claire. Um, um, 
I'll be spending time with families. Um, I have been working hard with my kids, and it's hopefully uh, they won't get better. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Strobel, you have one minute. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, it's I know like it's shuffling a, papers. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a tradition uh, that on the last day a council member uh, who does not seek re-election uh, gets to say a few words, um, probably uh, a bit self-serving. <clears throat> and um, I never say just a few, so please bear with me on this. If you, and I, I wasn't quite sure what to, what to say here, so just uh, bear with me. But uh, after serving 12 years in a leadership role on the uh, very busy Eastside Hill Neighborhood Association, um, then two years on the City of Eau Claire's Planning Commission and being elected to six years on the City Council. That's 20 years of giving back to my uh, community. Um, a lot of time with citizens and in meetings and uh, I'm just not quite sure if I'm going to be able to find anything else to do with that time. <laughs> um, but I'm, but gonna, I'm gonna try. Um, early years on, my early years on the City Council were dominated by the Confluence Project. Um, there's parts of it I remember well. Um, I led an effort through the Landmarks Commission to try and save a building that was on the uh, National Register of Historic Places. The Landmarks Commission voted to designate the Klein Building as a local landmark, which would have allowed 18 months before it was torn down. And the only way that could be overturned is by council based on specific criteria. Um, after long meetings, the council did overturn it on a six to five vote. Um, but we made the effort, and out of that effort, I believe good things happened. Uh, the developers promised a storefront facade, um, similar to what was there now, so that it would better fit in with the surrounding buildings. Uh, different color brick, varying roof lines, and I'm sure it looks better than it might have without having that community conversation. Um, I've always had the philosophy that when a decision has been made and the body is spoken, you don't hold grudges, you move on, you try to find that common ground on the next item if possible. The other good thing that came from that was that Dan Klumpner asked me to be uh, one of two council members on the theater design committee. A um, Couple things I like to think that I influenced on that was the initial drawings uh, came to us and uh, they had a bump out on the first floor um, towards the plaza there. Um, I expressed that downtown plans called for a viewing corridor of the river. We were planning a library plaza and this blocked that river view down Eau Claire Street. I think you'll notice now that there is a bump out, but it's on the second floor, and um, it does allow for a view of the river. Um, I also advocated for a pedestrian field of Graham Ave so that the facade fit in with the existing streetscape better, and that we'd have a decent entrance on Gibson Street um, so it was not treated like a back door. And obviously others felt the same way, um, but these are positives, I think, from, that came from losing that Landmarks decision. Um, I don't think the citizens expected my position on the Confluence Project. I think everybody knows that I, I own a commercial building sort of right in the middle of all of that and that it would have been a big benefit to my property. Um, yet, I didn't let my personal feelings override my concerns for all the citizens and the taxpayers of Eau Claire. Um, I was elected to represent them all and, and not my own feelings. I worked hard to make this the best project possible uh, to be sure the city did not own it, nor were they going to be responsible for any potential future operational losses. We put protections in place for those concerns, and we made sure the student housing portion was taxable for 50 years, which protected the taxpayers in the event someone wanted to attempt to make them tax exempt. The council ultimately got to a point where we could all support this project unanimously. As a council member, frequently in the minority, believe it or not, um, I worked hard to garner support for amendments which might make a resolution or ordinance more acceptable to be able to get me to a yes vote. Um, please consider reasonable amendments, um, even if you have the majority. Sometimes a different perspective makes for a better final product. Um, I was a natural fit to be involved with the downtown parking, and the parking ramp is probably my favorite project. Initially it was to be cited where the post office was on Barso Street, I remember advocating, you know, pushing it back if possible, trying to keep the parking off the river, uh, maybe allowing for a mixed-use building with housing overlooking the river in that spot. Um, it would also help us get more increment uh, for the TIF as well. And staff, I think staff agreed or 
and they worked on it, and they worked with Jamf and RCU, and the ramp was eventually moved further back, and now we have the liner site available. Um, the ramp was uh, designed with enough structure to add a fourth level, but TIF funding only allowed us to construct three levels. I felt the right way to build the ramp and the most appropriate and the least expensive time to add another level was right away and not later. I worked with a city engineer, Dave Strobel, to come up, I mean, Dave Strobel. <laughs> I'm gonna miss that. Um, <laughs> to come up with ideas. And when it came to appropriate funding, I, uh, I brought forth a resolution indicating support for a fourth level, asking staff to bring financing alternatives back to the council. That resolution passed six to four. Two weeks later, council voted to add a fourth level to the ramp on an eight to three vote. Um, I always enjoyed it when past council members would refer to the fourth level as the struggle deck. So. <laughs> and of course, let's not forget our train tonight, the Sioux Lines 2719 steam locomotive. We were able to regain ownership um, so future generations might have the ability to bring her home. I just want to hit briefly on two committees uh, that we used to have, EPAC and FISPAC, uh, something that council members talk about a little bit now. but. These committees had three council members that were, they were the only committees we had that council voted to put three people on. Um, they allowed for more interaction with fellow council members and with staff from differing departments. Um, I, I don't miss the work, but I, but I didn't support their demise either. Um, I chaired the FISPAC committee um, for two years and, and we had a work plan to council. Um, council reproved it and we were required to do an annual report every year. Um, a couple successful projects we brought through that and worked very hard on were the alley improvement policy and the special assessment policy. Um, we had many meetings. All the different departments were there. They weighed in. We did research. Commission members split up and went out to different neighborhoods for feedback. And I think the alley improvement process we brought forward has probably been one of the most well-received policies by the citizens and the council. And I think that was probably due to the work that went into it prior to reaching council floor. Um, I really need to thank Kathy Morrell for that. Um, she, she kept us on task. Um, she took, took the minutes. She put our reports together. And, and I'll bet most of you don't know this, but what always impressed me about Kathy, she's got awesome shorthand. So if you've <laughs> never seen that, I was always amazed by that. So I really, really appreciated her help on that committee, and she got me through that. Um, it was an honor for me to serve with the citizens the past served the citizens of Eau Claire the past six years to work on with 18 different council members. Um, and I want to especially thank City Manager Peters and his entire staff, current and former, for all the work they did to help me be as successful as I could be as a council member. Um, I'm sure I'll miss it, um, but I just wanted to thank, thank you all and wish you all continued success. Thank you, Councilmember Strobel. Thank you, Councilmember Zhang, for uh, all of your years of service. And um, I just wanted to say a few words, too, as it's uh, my last meeting uh, in this seat. Um, I have really appreciated the opportunity to be able to uh, serve as the acting president over the last 10 months. Uh, and I'm incredibly proud of uh, the work that we've actually been able to accomplish in that time. Um, I look at uh, our budget amendments, and one that specifically came forward this evening, in fact, um, we're, we're working on this 100-day sprint to impact and try to house uh, folks who are uh, homeless right now in our community. And it came up in the conversation, the opportunity that uh, we need help with landlord liaison and some potential support for um, backstop funding to be able to support people that are going that are coming off of our streets and, and into homes. And right away that um, uh, City Manager Peters and I were there and the idea that, um, and, and the funding source that we helped put into the budget was brought up um, as an opportunity to in fact um, make a positive impact. And I look at that and look at our council and, and it tells me that the work that we do is so incredibly important um, for improving people's lives. Um, and it, and it may just be 16 folks who are coming off the street, but it's so much more than that. Um, from our, our work on um, removing lead service lines uh, with Mr. Pippinger, um, the work that we're trying to do um, when we deprioritize uh, our marijuana fines in our city, um, the work that we do 
um, on sustainability and making sure that we are responsible uh, and looking forward um, to future generations in terms of the impacts of climate and the impacts of um, emissions uh, from our community. Uh, when it comes to food security, uh, so many things that we do in our community have a huge impact on folks' lives. Uh, and so I'm really proud that um, whether it's the library position or so many other things that we are able to and were able to in this last year take bold stances that I think uh, our community appreciates and, and can see and can uh, recognize that, um, you know, we are putting our best faith effort in um, standing up for a community that works for everyone. And, you know, I, I, I have so appreciated the opportunity um, to, to help lead the council over that time. Um, I also have uh, the utmost respect for um, our incoming president-elect Terry Weld. And um, I have, uh, I know that in his heart, he wants to uh, continue the, the, the service to our community um, to help us all tackle those um, pressing problems of our, of our community that we've identified and already sort of um, uh, laid out in, in, in front of us um, in terms of affordable housing, um, in terms of our older neighborhoods and, and how we make a difference and continuing our progress, I think, as well on, on sustainability. And so um, I look forward to working with him and supporting him as he takes over this role um, this coming year um, and will do whatever I can to be supportive um, uh, in, in whatever way you need. Um, I think beyond that, I just want to um, recognize uh, incoming council members, new council members elected, uh, Laura Benjamin, um, also uh, Mr. Klinkhammer, who was here this, this evening earlier, um, and Mr. John Lohr, as well as um, elected members who um, are staying with us, and that would be Council Member Emmanuel and Council Member Beaton. Um, I think our, our city is strong, our council is strong, um, and I actually think that our relationships um, uh, with city staff and with our community are, are growing stronger. And to me, that's an exciting opportunity. Um, I've also had the pleasure of working um, much closer with city manager Peters and I'm gonna miss our, um, I don't think we quite got down to weekly, but um, uh, our, our frequent visits and, and work together. Um, I, I, um, I, again, uh, have a deep respect for the work that you do and um, and your in your ability to um, to help with with all of the, the the provisions and things that it takes to make sure that that we're successful as well. Um, I want to thank Kathy Marol, um, our, our our city uh, clerk as well, uh, Ms. Repel, and um, our city attorney and, and assistant city attorney, and all the city staff that put in so much incredible work for our city. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to work uh, with you as a as a as the acting city council president. Um, and I look forward to continuing to serve on the council. Um, I'm, I'm certain, I'm, I know that we, uh, we're going to have to choose seats, but I'm just already eyeing out which seat, seat I would like to have. Um, <laughs> but I think, but I think beyond that, um, uh, just a huge thank you to, to all of you for your service, um, for the opportunity, um, uh, that I had to, uh, to help lead our council and also, uh, for the opportunity to serve our community. Uh, in this position, so I appreciate it. With that, I think our meeting is adjourned on a motion by Councilmember Strobel and Jean. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the City of Eau Claire. A transcript of this meeting is available for the hearing impaired. It will be available within seven days of this telecast. Call 715-839-4912 or TDD 715-839-1689 or write Eau Claire City Clerk, P.O. Box 5148, Eau Claire, Wisconsin 54702-5148. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.